Okay, so we're, we're ready. Yeah, we are ready. Great. Uh, well, thank you. Um, thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, my name is Seth Jensen. Um, I am a professional planner. I currently work for the Monroe County Planning Commission in Morrisville, Vermont. Um, just uh, to, to begin, um, I'm also a member of the Local Planning Commission in the town of Westford and on the executive committee of the Vermont Planners Association. Um, so I wear um, many hats um, in planning in the state of Vermont. Um, I'm here to provide uh, some information and background on, on that experience and that perspective. Um, but the testimony uh, is my own. Um, it's not an official uh, position of either the, the local planning commission or my employer, the regional planning commission. Um, so, one of the reasons that um, I did want to appear before this committee is because it's very it's very important um, to look at Act 250 from the perspective of. Um, our smaller communities um, that are collectively becoming referred to uh, as the other Vermont. Um, I've spent a, a large amount of my career uh, working in those in those communities, and the needs and issues are are similar, but also have um, important uh, important distinctions um, and unique uh, considerations that. Um, that really need to be on the table for Act 250 reform to be effective. So before before getting into the nuts and bolts of Act 250, I do want to just take a moment to talk about one of the charges of the committee that began meeting 18 months ago, which is the vision of Vermont in the next 50 years, and specifically what is the vision of our rural communities 50 years from today? And that is important because many of those communities are currently struggling. Um, they're struggling with decline of their grain list. They're struggling with decline of the population. Um, you're seeing a opioid crisis that is tearing apart the fabric of many of our communities. Um, we're hearing every day about challenges of small farms and uh, general stores. But that image does not, it, it, it does not complete, it is not a complete image as well, and it does not fully represent my experience uh, working with those communities. I have had the, the honor of being able to work with more than a dozen small towns in the state of Vermont and see the ability for well thought out planning um, and community engagement to unlock the potential of those communities. Um, and in every, in every case have seen uh, after, uh, after a planning process, um, new energy um, and many times new development uh, that is in keeping with the character of the communities while creating opportunity uh, jobs and housing in areas that at one time um, were uh, passed over um, as forgotten. Uh, most recently, in my own hometown of Westford, the first permit um, in the last 20 years in our town center was issued uh, for a general store on our common. Um, the story in Vermont is that general stores are closing. Uh, that is true, that is the trend, um, but we have at least one example uh, that is that is beating that trend um, in Lamoille County's county seat um, Hyde Park Village at the same time that, that general store in Westford opens there will be a new restaurant on Main Street open opening again this is a this is a village that was considered undevelopable um, for various reasons 10 years ago um, that is uh, proven not to be the case so the question then comes how do we harness that energy and what role can Act 250 reform um, play to harness that energy? 
And, I, and this is where I think the important distinction between uh, our smaller towns and the more urban communities come uh, is that much of our current discussion really focuses on do we expand jurisdiction or do we reduce jurisdiction? And for some of the smaller communities, really the better question is how do we make the process uh, more predictable for smaller applicants? Um, are, these are not large developers doing uh, these, these projects in these communities. Um, they're often uh, very small uh, applicants, often um, independent uh, people who are only going to go through the Act 250 process once in, in, once in their lives. Um, and many of our smaller towns and villages just simply don't have the administrative capacity or the infrastructure or the financial resources to obtain uh, what's required for the exemptions. Um, but we still need to make sure the process works for them. Um, so that's what I would like, will spend most of my time talking about. Um, and there's an important, important uh, element of Act 250 to consider here, and that is that in many ways, Act 250 has been beneficial for rural communities in ways that perhaps we don't discuss enough. Um, Act 250 ensures that smaller communities are on equal footing when there are large projects in their, in their towns. Um, I'll give an example uh, in Main Street, um, in Johnson Village, um, Maple Fields uh, had an application to uh, redevelop the main block uh, of that village. Their initial application was um, very typical suburban strip uh, type layout that was not consistent with the community's vision for that area. Um, to their credit, Maple Fields worked with the community to revise that site plan to one that fit with the streetscape that did account for pedestrian uh, access um, and also accounted for the river uh, on the, the other side. Um, but you know, the fact that there was an Act 250 process that that community would have standing in probably contributed to that decision. Um, next door in Hyde Park, when the McMahon Chevrolet dealer was looking at expanding, um, Act 250 and the local uh, zoning um, led that, uh, that business to redevelop a former industrial site rather than lo locating in a green field. Um, the result of that was that uh, wetlands that were impacted by the prior development, which occurred before we really understood the, 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 the benefits and impacts to that development. It wasn't anything uh, malicious that was done by the prior owner, but it was an impact. Um, were repaired, um, and the modern stormwater system actually reduced the amount of stormwater and phosphorus entering our watershed and entering the Lake Champlain wa watershed. Um, you all know that's important for, for many reasons. Um, and there, there are, of course, counterexamples of application, applicants who run into challenges or conflicts um, with other state permits. Um, we have a question. Yes. Yeah. That's the Lamoille River watershed. The Lamoille River watershed, yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so my first uh, piece that I'd like to just talk about is how do how do we get to those good outcomes um, in a more predictable process, especially for the small applicants? Um, now, do I control this screen? You can, yeah. <laughs> okay. You can zoom in if you want to. Okay. Bigger. Also, you can, okay. If you're talking about a particular paragraph, yeah. if you want us to read it, we also have it on our iPad. You do. Okay. I might everyone, just if you, refer to you to that because I'm, I'm very bad at being a millennial and this stuff yeah. kind of freaks me out. It's better now. So, so you okay. can just. Slide where you are if you want. Or, or. Okay, great. So um, one of the reasons that one of one of the changes that's happened since Act 250 was adopted is that uh, when Act 250 came to be, most communities did not have robust local uh, planning or zoning. Um, that has been um, a big change over the last uh, 45 or so years, um, and has uh, you know been beneficial uh, in shaping development. Um, but as that local planning and zoning has become more robust, so have the chances for conflict. 
Um, one of the right ways several years ago that um, that the legislature has attempted to uh, address that is by um, creating this concept, not a concept, but a definition of, of an existing settlement. And on the last page, there's a table uh, that I is a generalized partial list, over, overly simplified, of various criteria where whether you're in an area for development or outside an area for development, um, how different criteria are applied uh, may, may differ. Um, one of the challenges is that that's not necessarily consistent across agencies. Um, and in some cases, the, the distinctions may lead to interagency. Um, I don't want to use the word conflict, but it's not a better word for it. So I will use the word conflict. Um, and it's, it's really better to deal with those issues through the uh, planning process rather than the regulatory process. That way, when you have a small applicant appearing before the district commission or the local board, um, or for a state permit, um, you kind of know what's expected before going into um, before going into it. Uh, and that can save a lot of time and a lot of resources for a small applicant. Um, and, and just when I talk about small applicants, bear in mind that in in, in Act 250, if you're doing a commercial or industrial development, the jurisdictional trigger varies uh, whether you're in a community with zoning or without zoning, but it's based on lot size. So the result is that in communities, rural communities where lots are generally larger, um, Act 250 may cast a wider net and capture things like small independent contractor yards. Uh, it's not a negative necessarily, but it is a rec uh, important to recognize who in these communities may be going through Act 250 um, so that we make a process that is easy for them to follow. Yeah, we have a question. Yes. Uh, just a point of clarification, I didn't quite understand what you meant between a planning process versus a regulatory <coughs> that local government process is the planning process as opposed to a local regulation using their bylaws so, um, compared to what you're generally using the term regulatory meeting activity. Can you yeah, just clarify? That? Sure, sure. Um, so one of the, um, I guess it's step back to um, state planning statute, which envisions um, a coordinated uh, planning process at state, local, and regional level that encourages um, citizen engagement. One of the things that the Act 250 reform bill attempts to do, or, or I interpret the attempt to do through um, things such as the capability and development plan, the um, increased review of, of local and regional plans, is to begin coordinating our various planning processes. Um, so I think yes to all of the above, um, that uh, the, the local planning process, um, especially on the issue of where the most appropriate areas for development um, should be, uh, is, is sort of the, the, beginning, the beginning place. And I, I think that's really important for structuring Act 250 for smaller communities. Um, because it is, it is very possible for some of our smaller, uh, smaller settlements to be missed when you're looking at them from a statewide level. Um, there are also important considerations at the statewide level, but the local process, um, which has checks and balances through, the, through review at the regional level of other neighboring municipalities, um, can be the guide. Uh, what we have now, though, is um, a disconnect between that process and perhaps the, and the agency uh, comments and review, um, where to, to, to use a, an actual example, you might have a situation where there's an area that's been defined for uh, a greater intensity of development, um, and there might be conflicts between uh, the agency of transportation uh, review um, related to 
requirements of something like a turning lane and the uh, Agency of Natural Resources 9, 9L review of wanting pedestrian connectivity, um, and then the Agency of uh, Agriculture review of um, agricultural soils. And what happens, and, and I've seen happen, then is every agency wants their own meeting with the applicant, and they're not doing anything wrong. That's how the process is currently structured. They're doing their jobs. Um, so it's not an agency staff problem. Um, if the process was structured where there was the, that question happened first of, are we in or are we out? All of the agencies are on the same page. The district commission is on the same page and the um, local uh, review boards are on the same page. And the chances for an applicant um, getting sort of stuck in a jurisdictional dispute between different arms or levels of government are, are really reduced. And those are the kinds of things that for those small applicants are really frustrating. Um, yeah. Hold on, uh, there was a tie. It'll go, okay. go to Representative Odie and then McCullough. Oh. So, Age before beauty. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So with the, what would, so in the, the way it works now, mm -hmm. if you see each of those agencies and each one says a different thing, then what happens? But and then what you're saying is, what what could be instead is that all the agencies would meet with the applicant or much, or they would all meet together and figure out what they thought worked best. Um, so um, that's a that's a that's a really good question. What happens now depends, uh, you know, somewhat from application to application. The larger applicants, um, like the, the resorts in, in our region, uh, tend to have you know, staff who are fixed costs, um, who work for them, who coordinate all of that. Uh, for the smaller applicants, um, who especially who may be not familiar with the process, um, they respond to agency questions as they come in. Um, and that can lead to things like multiple site visits with their uh, with their engineers or attorneys. Um, for them, those are not fixed costs. They're not, they don't have an attorney or an engineer on staff. Um, and so that's one of the things that drives, uh, can drive up the cost. Um, if, if the um, capability and development plan that's proposed in the legislation is structured, um, and I think in a way that, that is function, functional, um, that need for every agency to make their own determination is lessened, um, and there's the potential for more predictability. Um, no, I think how that plan is structured becomes really important, um, and I do have some concerns that the current structure is, um, is, is more, is more top-down uh, than it should be. Um, and provided in my comments was intentionally a provocative alternative, and I recognize it's a somewhat provocative alternative, um, but that was to sort of do the bookends for the committee um, to start a dialogue about how local governments and regional planning commissions might be more engaged uh, in that. And that's specifically on this question of the existing settlements, um, because that that's really where these interagency issues can can get really, really messy for a small applicant. I don't actually know if I answered your question or just confused me. Well, I followed what you're saying, yeah. but I still don't see how, what what some best practices might be. Mm -hmm. I still don't see how you avoid, how any applicant avoids agencies making different determinations. How wouldn't they just sit together and just so it would be great if um, you know, at one time um, earlier in the life of, of Act, Act 250, there was um, a, a greater tool for policy coordination between the agencies. That would be a great thing to move uh, back to. Um, and there will, there's always going to be some agency review. I don't want to leave you with the impression that we can totally cut that out. It's more um, 
I'll use the I'll use the Johnson Maple Fields example because it's really really illustrative of that. Um, if if that that that's lo that was located in the village center, the main intersection in Johnson's uh, village center. Um, what that means is that for V Trans, um, V Trans uh, would be looking at different standards for when a turning lane is required because they're also taking into account speed, the built environment, um, all of those things. That Agency of Natural Resources is looking at a different standard for their setbacks from stream buffers. If they all know that they're going to be looking at those different standards going in, then the discussion is how do you meet that different standard as opposed to what standard do we need to meet? And so that cuts off a, a, a that, that for, for a small applicant creates more predictability because they know, you know, it also reduces the potential for the dueling engineer problem that happens of, you know, should, should this be a road we're planning as a through road and therefore we need a, we need a, um, we need a turn lane as opposed to is this a road we should be preparing or planning for pedestrians. If that is predictable, if that's defined in the planning process, the opportunity for you know, another engineer or, or, you know, representing perhaps a competitor to say we disagree with VTrans on this basic level finding is, is, is reduced. All right, so I, what I'm getting is when you have the Act 250, when, when, you're, when, you, when the applicant, it's not Act 250, it's the agencies which have different things that they're applying. And they should be looking at the thing that is most yep. important to their agency. So then, maybe the question, you said something like, did the standard that they apply and the different mm -hmm. one, two questions they would ask, well, wouldn't the question they would ask be, how can we get this project happen? Not what standard do you apply? Because they have three different standards. One's looking at where the turn lane should be, mm -hmm. one looking at the, <coughs> the crossing of deer or something. Right. But the agency of ag can provide exemptions if it is something that makes sense. And when you think about farms, think about how many years ago farms were built in many instances, and think about where the rules and laws are today as far as restrictions. So. That's why there's this little flexibility that the agency bag has to make meaningful and thoughtful decisions on zoning. So I'll talk about that and that's in the RIP. So we talk about management and we, management and we talk about structures. And we talk about farms and how the agency bag regulates. So essentially I'll go through the management stuff first and then I'll go into the structures. So first thing, these rules apply to everybody. So keep that in mind. Who they do not apply to is if you lived in, just make an example up, if you lived in the city of Burlington and your neighbor had a pig in their backyard, we do not deal with your pig, right? However, if your pig is in the Winooski River causing a problem, we could deal with your pig. So we work with the town to decide if it's a water quality issue, we can take the lead. If it is not, and it's just a property parcel in Burlington and <clears throat> it butts all other parcels, no water nearby, and they just don't like the pig, we are not going to intervene. That's a local decision on managing nuisance and other factors that might come with that situation. So when we recently rewrote the RIPs, we, you know, what term you use, backyard farming is often, some people can relate to that in some way, is not what the agency that regulates. We regulate farming as defined. So, Anyone who is farming, you can apply to. And in the backyards, the towns can come up with what they need to. Because by definition, the farm doesn't fall under, the, the backyard farm doesn't fall under the RAP. So therefore, they can regulate it. So anyways, so when you look at these, you know, stacking manure, you cannot stack manure in a place where water is going to inundate, right? And whatever term you want to say, you know, there's a floodway, which is where when the river's high and it's moving fast, it's going to move in this area, the floodway. And when it's spreading out and it's going slower into the flood plain, that area as well. So in any of those areas, you cannot stack manure. You also can't stack compost, you can't stack food processing residuals, material that is a waste, you can't put there. Um, and then as far as nutrient management, so all of these farms need to have a nutrient management plan, which is the, the phosphorus, nitrogen, and potassium allocations for the crops. They need to meet the crop uptake 
Um, mm -hmm. They cannot apply in exceedance, where therefore it's no longer useful. So when you think about floodplains, you know, you've got to take soil tests, you've got to figure out what crop you're growing, you've got to figure out what it needs, and you, you meet that requirement. In addition, that's on all your land, but in your floodplains, you also have more restrictions on when you can apply manure. So the goal that we looked at from the science is a lot of the flooding does occur in the shoulder seasons, right? Not always during the main cropping season. A lot of the spring flooding, or even you know, currently we're probably going to have, you know, we're in flood stage in some areas, but um, there's a lot of ice in the river and it's going to back up. During these times of year, you cannot spread manure on fields or any other waste on fields, unless you get an exemption for us for an emergency situation which may be um, instances, and of course we wouldn't choose the floodplain as your first place, right? We would find another place that's more suitable on your farm or a neighboring farm. Um, first we try and find another storage for where you could put that so you don't put it on the land at all. So, you know, no one should be out there, basically, unless there's a real, real bind, which I, I've never seen a situation where we've had to go to a floodplain as a solution. Um, so, Beyond that, is we can also then require additional requirements. So the, the spreading band for the winter applies to everybody. And in floodplains, it's a wider band. So it starts in October and it goes all the way into mid-April. So understanding that if you have a, a farm and you have some floodplain, you need to make sure you address that so that you have capacity to be able to, to do the other lands later. Um, you cannot wait till the very end of the shoulder seasons to spread manure in the floodplains. It's restricted, right? To give them more protection, to make sure that there's more growth with the crop that's there and incorporation. If you do in the regular season where you are allowed to put manure, for instance, on a floodplain, you have to incorporate it or inject it pretty immediately um, so that it is not on the surface sitting there. And that's been in place for a very long time, that restriction. Um, we, in the last RAPs, put a lot of additional restrictions in what I like to call them um, sort of you should have known better actions. If it's really saturated or if it's um, full of snow and you know anyone looking at it goes, if you actually spread anything on that, it will run off. There's no question, right? That is where, and we've had instances you know, which prompted some of this where you know, we needed to take enforcement and have a clear rule that said you should have known better. Um, so there, those are as well in the rule. So, if somebody is actively operating on a floodplain and we knew that there was a high level of risk and it was well known, that could be something that we could enforce on if there was an instance of water quality. Any questions on manure application and storing of waste? Um, good morning. Um, what do you mean by frequently flooded land? Um, so that is a term that we came, so statewide, all soils are mapped. Then they had this classification of frequently flooded, occasionally flooded, you know, there's a designation based on the soil type and where it generally falls in the landscape. And that is the designation that we use as frequently flooded based on those NRCS soil maps. So if you look at your farm, you can turn on that layer and then you can turn on the frequently flooded layer. And that's the layer that we use for that regulatory standard. So in typically what my experience is, it's a, it's a 100 year floodplain. So, Okay, so buffers and setbacks. Um, the agency of ag requires on any river a 25 foot. Um, actually, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going back for a second. Um, so, can you explain nutrient management plans? Like, they're not actually designed to reduce, they're not, they're just not designed to improve water quality, they're designed to maximize output while minimizing cost of inputs. No, um, they were originally born many, many moons ago for crop production. That part's true. I mean, the fallacy is that since then, you know, there have been more tools that have been piled into what you have to do to build a plan, and those are all water quality tools. So like an example would be the phosphorus index. It's all about water quality, that entire tool. So it's about how far away is the water, what type of management are you doing such that the pro proximity and likeliness that nutrients could get to water would happen. So. That whole tool is looking at soluble phosphorus and particulate phosphorus and how it transports and whether the risk of transport is high or low given all the activities that you are doing. So while yes, the idea of, of, you know, of applying nutrients and thinking about crops is, is core, part of it, the water quality and risk assessment tools that are inside of it, the erosion tools, the phosphorus nutrient tools, 
those are all very specific to water. So that, that has definitely been something that I've heard people argue, and um, I just want to be really clear, it, it, they are really much at this point with the technology and innovation and research water quality focused. Um, I, I guess I also have a couple more questions. If you're talking about manure, can you use chemical fertilizers in these annually flooded places? Um, it says the term is actually manure or other ag waste, which can include all of those items. So it's really, it's a pretty broad spectrum of things that you cannot be spreading. In so it really just means fertilizer in any type? It, it could mean, it could be waste feed, right? It, it's a very broad term to say that you really shouldn't be putting anything in these areas. So it includes chemical fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this is just because I know we've been promoting no-till in these kind of areas. Does glyphosate have phosphorus in it? It's a very minuscule amount such that it isn't something as far as like the operations on a dairy farm to be considered as far as a major risk factor in terms of phosphorus. But it has it in it. Yeah, glyphosate. Yeah. yeah. Representative. Morgan. Some farms are very large and they're not easily seen from the road. <coughs> Who monitors? How is it monitored to see that these rules are being followed? Sure, that, that's our job. Uh, we have 11 inspectors that go out on these farms. Um, traditionally, what we're talking about here is mostly dairy farms or large-scale vegetable production farms. Um, all of them either fall under a certification or a permit by us, and we have requirements and statute that tell us how often we at minimum have to get there um, you know. So you have the right to just stop it and say, we're going to walk your back fields along the river well, to see we, if you have fences, buffers, etc. We try to be a little more respectful than that. <laughs> but you can do that. Yes. Okay. Yes. We, we, we give people a call and let them know. We want them to join us so that they can see what we see, so that they can correct what we see if we see something wrong. Okay. Representative Dolan. Uh, just another question about nutrient management planning. Does nutrient management planning, is it tied to the phosphorus in the soils so that if you have, if you've reached a certain threshold in nutrients within the soils, it may affect your application of manure even during um, the post winter spreading Absolutely. where a farmer is trying to manage their, their manure after storage for so many months. Um, would that nutrient management plan uh, limit the application of it in areas that have high amounts of phosphorus, or does it say that you can re-estimate the amount of uptake that phosphorus can handle? Can, can you help us yeah. a little bit? Yeah, I, these are very some, detailed nuances, but I'll give you big pictures. Just so examples. that we can have some confidence mm -hmm. in the nutrient management planning process to help manage the nutrients. Mm -hmm. So essentially the phosphorus index, if we get back to that tool, um, you put in all your different management. And the output might be because your soil levels are so high in phosphorus that you cannot apply more phosphorus because you have what you need to grow the crop that you said you were going to grow. And therefore, it'll give you a big red square at the top and say no, um, which means you cannot apply any nutrients. So you can try and look and say, well, okay, well, what if I did something different? Can I get it out of that no box? And then you actually have to implement that. And that's what we check. We look at your plan. We look at what you're doing on your farm. We look at your records and see, are you following that plan? But there certainly are several farms in the state of Vermont, um, due to historic management in the past, where you know they, one farm has bought the farm next door, and they know that they can't apply manure at all to that one farm. That farm was abused by previous landowners. So that is a real thing. It cuts you off and says no. Um, in the RAPs, we also put that if your soil test level starts to get above 20 parts per million, you have to have a drawdown strategy. There is, there is some science, but there is no guarantee that just because your soil is high, it actually means you're polluting. It could very well stay in place, but we still want to think about the risk reduction. So while you may not get a red block saying stop, you can't add any more in that instance, we still want you to do something. So we've added an additional state layer to say you need to think about a reduction strategy, which may be you know cutting your manure applications back, trying different methods of setbacks, for instance. So. There's a whole lot of tools that people can use. They put it all in here and it spits out what the outcome would be. But it is a very, it is a real thing and it does happen that these farms, you know, it's not widespread, but it is real that it will shut you down. It will just keep you from adding more phosphorus. You could still grow. Absolutely. And yeah. You could till in an annually flooded land. You can. I mean, most, what I've seen with some folks is, you know, they're, they're 
they're more mindful of that you can till in those lands. And they may till to plant, but they won't till in the fall because they don't want it loose. So, you know, they'll have more skull, uh, gully erosion or scour, which it doesn't help them at all, and they recognize that. Um, the one thing I've noticed about people who manage floodplains, they are a lot more cognizant of their management actions. Um, they think about it, they engage with us a lot more in conversations about it, because it is something, when you live near a river, you know it, and you watch it, and you've got a lot of experience with it. Mm -hmm. Representative McCullough. Um, so I, 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 I appreciate your comment that that there's a very small amount of phosphorus and glyphosate, um, and, and I'm not doubting that, but what I don't understand is what that amount is, um, or the best way to compare it is, would it be by, by pounds of, of the total product? Um, but I'd like to know, I'd like to know what, I'd like to have that statement quantified. Um, additionally, I need to better understand um, the role of the phosphorus in glyphosate. Uh, does it have a short half-life as well because it facilitates the, the, um, the active ingredient getting into the plant so that it, like, pretty much within a matter of hours is not in the soil anymore and it's in the plant? Um, uh, and I think that'll help us better understand if the glyphosate um, actually, even though it may be a small amount of phosphorus, may <coughs> be um, sometimes small things make a big difference. And I'd like to know how that would overlay on a farm nutrient management plan with a red block up in the corner. No more phosphorus, please. And so if you guys just kind of, you know, uh, poke carry and you may have that, you know, information all of your own. We do. We have some information we've already developed, and I will get to that. But right now, I don't. No, not now. But no, no. We no, have. No. I mean, this question has come up multiple times throughout the years, and yeah. we've answered it. Um, and yeah, yeah. it, it could be just a little catalyst that's insignificant, but need to. Know. Thank yeah, you. that's okay. Education's good. Um, so I'll go back. So buffers, which um, in the regulations, just have to be at least grass. You can also do trees. There is something in statute that says if we require a farm to plant trees, we have to buy an, an easement. Um, so there's a there's a distinction there that these rules say you have to plant grass at the very least. We have programs that have, if people voluntarily want to plant trees, we obviously help them and can facilitate that. Um, and that's called the CREP program or Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program. Um, so 10 foot on a ditch, 25 foot on a surface water, and if we feel like those are insufficient, the agency of ag, you know, we have a whole tool that we built that'll run through the matrix, take all the data, the management from the field in, and consider, should it be wider? So if we have a concern that we think it might be wider or it needs to be wider, we can run that tool and we have the ability to tell the farm it needs to be wider. Of course, they have appeal rights and we'd go through that whole process as well, but um, that is built in. And then, um, as far as managing stream banks themselves, um, the RAPs, so we, we spent a lot of time when we were re revising the RAPs two times ago, three times ago, geez, um, which is actually fairly recent. I know that's something we've changed them every year for the last couple of years. So um, I want to say this is probably in 2014, maybe, if memory serves me right. We worked and spent a lot of time with DEC River Management Program. So you'll meet Mike Klein this afternoon from that program. To, to make sure that what we were doing for agriculture was consistent. So in a town, National Flood Insurance Program, for instance, um, is, is a really important program for towns, especially Vermont, given our conditions of, of flooding and, and being built on top of a lot of river systems. Agriculture, because that zoning piece is with not always with the town, we, we do our best to make sure that farms first comply with the town, but if there's an instance where they can't, the agency of ag and our decisions to issue a variance cannot put a town out of NFIP standards, right? So we work together with rivers to make sure that if we're going to approve something, it can be done based on all the river science. So for instance, if somebody needed to, you know, they, they had a, a barn that had burned down and they were trying to rebuild a portion of it, but historically it had been built in this area, 
but they wanted to, when they built it, they wanted to change the design at the end so that the, the back end of the barn was a little bit different. Technically, they're going to have to do an entire study of the river to make sure that they don't rise the river during that process of changing that floor plan of that barn. And so any foundational infrastructure that might be within the floodplain, you need to prove that you're not going to basically mess up the floodplain, right? And so that's, it's an expensive process. Um, we've only had two instances that I've seen it come up as a question. One was a barn fire up in the Northeast Kingdom, and the other was some work down in the, the River Delta um, with uh, greenhouses at the time, but we worked through that. So you have to do a really, it's a pretty intense study to understand whether you would rise the river at, at that cross section of the stream based on the work that you're doing in the footprint. So it tends to be costly. The farmers are responsible to do that work. Um, so you just don't you don't see that much activity in that realm, but that is the standard that is there is that if you want to try and If it makes sense and we approve it because it is the most sens sensible thing to do um, And there is no other alternative that then it bears to the farmer to make sure that they do that work to prove that it can be done And if it cannot be done, then it cannot be approved If they want to work on stabilizing a stream bank itself um, so if the river is cutting in there are sort of two types of projects that I see come in this realm. One is coming at property, like infrastructure, right? Which our natural reaction as citizens is to protect whatever infrastructure there is, right? Whether it's the city of Montpelier or a barn. And so in order to protect that stream bank from coming farther at it, you have to go through and make sure that you meet all the technical standards and work with River DEC, Agency of Ag, and USDA in many instances to ensure that it is done appropriately. Because the last thing you want is one, for it to fail, um, but you also have to make sure that you don't mess up the rest of the river system. If it's just crop land, um, they could go through that process. It's less likely that they would receive any financial support in those instances. Um, but the alternative that I've seen in the past, um, because it is a property, it is a property interest, it is their land, it is their crop production, it is something that you know is worthy of protection, from that standpoint of view, but we try to work with the farms to explain we have other programs that look at a more holistic approach, which is um, that river is moving because something else is pushed on it, right? And maybe it's the city <coughs> has infrastructure that then redirected the stream towards the stream bank. If the landowner is okay with it, the idea of letting that river carve a little bit more, <coughs> giving it more floodplain access, and basically buying an easement on some of that land to give the river that access, is a program that we work with DEC to create. So it's a river corridor easement program, and typically what we'll do is we'll overlay that crep tree planting program with that easement program and try and create more of a natural habitat and let the river find its balance, rather than trying to protect the river and then move the, the problem further downstream. Representative Lafayette. Thank you. Um, you know, whatever you want to call it, given the torrential rains we've been having the last couple of years, I'm wondering if the 100-year water mark is still a uh, it's still a reliable benchmark in terms of how high you know the water is going to come given whatever season. It seems to me in, in flux, it seems to me in change, and I'm, I guess, yeah, you know, basically it's related to how the climate is changing. I'm wondering how you, how you adjust it or how you kind of, if you still use it. So my recommendation would be you should talk to the USGS. Mm -hmm. uh, they manage a lot of this data. Um, all of the monitoring stations are USGS stations, and a lot of that work and data into the flood areas mm -hmm. is also done by them in conjunction with FEMA. We then rely on what they do. And so I, I can't speak to say that, you know, the, the, the tools that we've started to look at, and I was explaining this um, the other day, the, the whole system is dynamic by nature, right? It's a river system sure. and it's moving because it's where water's mm -hmm. flowing. To have a fixed map to say this is where that line is will never be static because it does move. In rivers like the Connecticut, sometimes in some portions of it, it's a little more static because it's dam controlled and has been that way for quite a while. Um, but there are no magic layers. You know, even the FEMA layer the property I previously owned, you know, they said we were in a floodplain and we were 20 feet high above the, the highest mark. The map is just wrong and you do a letter of map amendment and you do this whole process, right, to get out of paying expensive insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's the back, back way to, to re-correct everything that every example has, there is no, 
there's no magic bullet. And so we do our best to use these maps as the regulatory lines, mm -hmm. but then we all, no matter what you're doing, and even if you were thinking about it in Act 250, it will, there will never be a bright line where you could say, this is where this falls, because it will be dynamic and change. And just, there's, there's LIDAR, um, which is a, a way that you can take imagery of the ground, and it'll bounce back and reflect, so it'll give you some t topography so that you can see it can help you sort of understand where the river might go based on elevation. But even that, as you start, we, we were trying to do this when we were trying to build these RAPs to try and figure out how can we find a good map layer or create a good map layer to be clear. Because farmers wanted to know, like, do not tell me that you'll come let me know after the fact where right. that line should have right. been. They want to know up front. Um, that <coughs> you start building water behind something and getting the floodplain getting bigger and wider and you think about going you know, from you know, Hardwick to the Lamoil outlet there's a lot going on in that water <coughs> system that you, you, you just can't predict it, especially in these floodplain areas. And all it takes is one breakaway and everything changes from that point down. Um, so with increased rain and with increased activity, I think that, that <coughs> has certainly played out a bit more in some instances, especially as some of the policies have changed over time, you know, to not excavate in the river as much as once was 50 years ago those activities, many, many different management activities have led us to a different space between climate change and, and management, and now it's everything is, you know, the, the goal of the state DEC is, and, and agency back supporting this through this, this RAP process is try to be as natural as we can and find a new balance rather than to continue to put band-aids and shift the, the dynamics. And that includes uh, acquiring uh, land or sort of in the river that does flow it banks, it's kind of a it's not going to you know, basically have a, uh, an economic uh, adverse impact on you know, the farmer. Well, that's what we tried to create programs. So you'll learn what a river corridor easement is, which is um, essentially a river is going to move in some fashion, right? And the best predict, the tool that they use is just to say three belt widths, which is how wide does the stream take three of those on this side and three of those on that side and draw a line. You know, there's a lot of science behind getting there, and you've got to somehow simplify things, you know, to really play them out. We all cannot be hydrogeologists and trying to figure out where the line exactly should be to develop a program, but you can figure out that generally the river in the next hundred years is probably likely to be in here at some level. And so with farmers, what we will coordinate with DEC and our prep program is they'll essentially buy the ability for channel management rights. So it's essentially that whole floodplain says you can't, if, if they voluntarily choose it, you cannot put riprap anywhere along. <coughs> You're gonna let the river go, and as the river goes, the river takes your land, and you've been compensated for your channel management rights. So that's the kind of program that we've been working to implement. We've done a number of projects. We do it also with the River Conservancy and BLT, because they hold the easements um, to, to make sure that this stuff is stewarded in the future. But we've done quite a few of those projects, especially in some of these much more dynamic spaces where, again, farmers are aware of the conflict and we'll actually bring projects to us naturally, but we also have to kind of. I have a Representative Bates and then Re Representative <coughs> Bates question. So I have a question. I visit, I frequent a uh, stream that cuts a cattle pasture right in half, and the cows are out there and everything. So how does the state manage that? Because it flows right into the Wilumzak. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of curious about all this manure spreading and phosphorus and everything. So how do you keep that from going into the Walloom sack? Sure. So the, the standard and trying to write a rule for every situation is always a challenge. But the standard is that if those cows are creating such an impact that the, the stream banks are eroding and they're not just crossing at a crossing and it's causing a real mess, mm -hmm. that we can enforce on. One of our challenges, and if you've gone up into the hills and think about, I always think about Orange County because I just hiked a lot there doing livestock exclusion work is what we call it. Um, putting fences, trying to design fences in some of those areas there or in Addison County is a bear. You can't draw a straight line through the woods, right? right? And But the pasture itself may actually include a ton of that. So trying to be thoughtful and saying you don't have to fence every square inch that a cow might have access but may not actually be able to physically get there because there's so much vegetation or other things that are in the it's way. Flat. But if it's flat and it's open, you know, we have programs that we can help people get into the spaces. If it becomes such that they are truly causing a problem and it's chewing it up and it's, you know, especially overgrazing can often cause that where they're coming in and out. The density of animals is really a challenge. 
But if you've got, you know, 10 acres and one animal, that's a small animal, you're not going to cause a big issue for the cost benefit of if you had 100 animals in a very small that's space. That's what we're talking. Yeah. So you should, we should probably talk so that we can find out more about that site. It's a good um, fishing stream, but <clears throat> certain parts of it where they don't cross. They cross all over the place, so. Yeah, they've got to have defined crossings, and they've got to manage the, the vegetation and the erosion on the stream bank. If those things cannot happen, we can step in. Okay, thanks. So, so we tried to build it that way so that there was some flexibility for sites that it just didn't make sense because yeah. it actually some, some sites can be beautiful and it's remarkable. Um, with a few animals having still access, but when you get your density up, it gets to be a problem. All right, thank you. Representative mm -hmm. McCullough. So, um, I understand some years ago um, we we um, prohibited <coughs> berming um, to protect um, agricultural fields from flooding not just the rivers but the um, the branches that feed the river, and how and, and we did that because that practice had been done. Is there, is there a program that, that helps um, take those berms away um, for, the per, for, for the obvious purpose of, of allowing inundation flooding to occur to reduce damage downstream? So I strongly encourage you to ask Mike Klein more about this, because yep. at this point, berming, there may be instances where they allow it. It's their program, right? Okay. Um, we do not regulate that. If someone said to us, we would like to burn, we would say, you need to go talk to DEC. Okay, good. Uh, we'll be talking with him. <laughs> so, you know, certainly ask them. But, you know, there might be instances where protecting downstream or something. There may be some other situation yeah. about the, the site that it may make sense. And I do know that there was a site after Irene that the burn blew out in Irene, and they were able to put it back. So yeah. it just all depends on okay. the situation, yeah. I think. Yeah. But as far as removing the berms, again, talk to my client, but you know, we've worked with agricultural property landowners. There's, there's some old rail beds that are out there that obviously would impact the floodplain, not having full access right. to the site. And they've definitely done projects where they'll remove or yeah. lower the, the right. railroad to be able to create more right. connection to the floodplain. So you know, those are the type of activities that obviously are really good for water quality. One of the big things in the TMDL is a, a stream bank balance and trying to get to there. And so some of those clean water fund dollars have been used for these projects when they've been identified. And, and just, you know, just That's right. we're done on it, but I just want to say I understand that those berms were done legally. Uh, it's not any kind of a, uh, in a yes. There's an but evolution. No. Yeah, it's all gone through. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, are, you're not quite finished. Yeah, so the, the, basically, if you want to do anything on a stream bank, you know, you, you need to make sure you follow standards. If you want to do any kind of stream crossing, like a bridge or, or a culvert replacement, you need to communicate with DEC. There's levels where if um, the watershed is very small, you don't need to report, but if the watershed starts to get bigger, you do need to report. You do, and, but no matter what, you need to meet basic minimum good practices as you do it. So. That is all stuff um, you should definitely engage with DEC with, but that's where we wrote our RAPs to say you've got to follow the DEC requirements and we work in with that. Um, and then, so the last one here is the zoning piece, and I've talked a little bit about that, but you know, essentially, we can't put infrastructure in these sensitive areas unless you can show that you're not going to impact that, that flood stage, right? So they call it a no-rise study, is the, the general term. And then where you may not be in, you know, this broad floodplain area, but you're near like a small stream that might come through. Um, because one of the things in Vermont that we'll see is that even small streams coming out of the hillside can do a lot of damage, even though they may not actually flood, right? Because they've got so much topography slope. They can still erode and carve, which are these alluvial erosion hazard areas. Um, staying away from any stream bank is a priority of ours for any infrastructure because we don't then want you to protect it after the fact. So if we can be preventative up front for new infrastructure, we do that. Um, for add-ons to additional structures, we, we really try and look at it and think, is that necessary? Um, so that's the process. We have a, a team at the agency that will go through and review the applications. Um, we connect intensely with the town because we're going through this process because no matter what a farmer does, even though the agency of ag can issue them an exemption, they have to tell the town what they're doing. And the purpose of that is so the town is the one, again, they, they're responsible for their flood insurance 
And they can tell them, this is potentially in a floodplain. You need to be aware of that, right? They can have that first level of communication. Um, we've had instances where you know, people do it. It's not a judgment of farm or not farm, but started to develop something, a, 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 did some excavation in the floodplain. And we were notified. If they didn't go to the town first, you know, we, we went through our enforcement process to address this, because that is the requirement, is you have to communicate with your town in step one. Um, they had to stop all construction. They had to cease everything, because you cannot get into that situation where you compromise flood insurance. And there was an alternative, and it, it wasn't done. They didn't do the study. You know, so like those things are where we were able to step in and say, it's not OK. So. There's, there's a lot of restrictions in here as far as how to manage floodplains. And you know, obviously for us, it's an important space because it's really good crop production, typically. Um, so there's an interest, and that's where our, our fertile land is, is these older floodplains and the, and the newer ones as well. Um, but there's a, it's obviously a dynamic space. And to be sensitive to water quality, to be sensitive, sensitive to erosion and other downstream impacts, we tried to build these rules so that we could accommodate all of those things and work with DEC to do it along the way. <coughs> Representative Terenzini. Yeah, Laura, how many dairy farms are left in Vermont? Uh, the count, pardon me, Diane Bothell, Vermont Agency of Agriculture, as of uh, February earlier this week, seven, uh, 697 commercial dairies, cow dairies. Jeez. Seven, down from 700 in January, so three between January and February. <coughs> Loss of three. <coughs> so I, I just, I'm struggling to understand how we're... Um, managing sort of the, the production of annual crops in flooded areas that are on impaired waters and like so I'm sort of looking at this at, I guess can you give me a sense of how much land is in that situation where they're actually doing an annual crop and on an impaired water that's you know in a location that's annually flooded or flooded frequently so let me say one thing before I answer that. I also forgot to mention that in these floodplains, they have to cover crop if they're growing an annual crop. So that's a new requirement. Or at least if they're growing some crop that can't be cover crop because of the timing of it, they have to leave a 30% residue over the winter so that it is protected. So of, the, of the annual crop? Yeah, so if you're growing some other type of crop that doesn't get harvested. so Or like some corn can get harvested for grain. So leave a lot of the debris. You know, They'll take the, the, the cob, but leave a lot of the debris. Um, so that way it's protected. So that was a requirement that we changed in the last one. So trying to keep year-round protection on these sites so that you have growth you have some for all the time that's, that's you know, connected into the soil and building soil health. Um, but as far as the identification of the number of acres, um, we could try and go through that exercise. I don't have that data and I don't think we've crunched it because the <coughs> cropping changes on a regular basis, right? So we have looked at studies looking at basically, you know, a farm has so much that it needs based on if the feed that it's come up with and the balance that it has, but it may flip completely between corn and hay. So to, to be able to one day snapshot in time, all that data is, protect, is provided to the USDA. And I've tried, I have to go to Fort Collins to get that data at that mass level, um, which isn't easy and it's a long process. So we sort of just didn't, we didn't worry about <laughs> that. We instead focused on everywhere just do a better management job rather than, than dealing with trying to figure out the specifics because it is so dynamic. As soon as you know the answer, the ch it's going to be changed. Um, I, don't, I, I don't know if that's helpful to you, but you know, overlaying impaired streams, obviously some stay impaired for a bit longer, or but lakes. those... I mean, Lake Carmi, Lake you know, Champlain, I guess I'm trying to get a sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems like we're trying to get phosphorus out, but we're putting it in at the same time when we, when we do this. And then we heard testimony two, a couple Fridays ago about um, farmers sort of realizing that it wasn't as productive of an area as they thought it would be, or they changed and sort of voluntarily moving out of those areas. But, um, you know, we're trying to clean up the waters, and I just have a hard time with having lands that obviously, if they're annually flooded, they're going to be polluting that water. And if it's impaired, how do we address that? Well, so there's another backstop that does exist. Um, so with USDA, you know, if you have insurance on your crop, if you are in a floodplain and it actively is flooding and causing damages, emergency conservation program is what they used to call it. I don't, I'm starting to date myself with that. I'm losing track of the program names. But um, you get three strikes. So if you come to say, I need assistance 
in this field because the river has done something to scour majorly, you know, it's bad enough that it, you know, you've got an issue. By the third time you ask for it, they do not help you. For crop insurance. The, the, the amount of payment that they would give you in the distance is tied to your crop pr production and the insurance that you've gotten. So they've got a model there that they've built that says basically three strikes and you're out. And so a lot of the programs, and, and so for instance, think about um, the wetland protections that have happened. So a lot of these lands that have had low productivity, major flooding problems, can no longer get any support to help protect that site because it isn't, it isn't worth it, essentially, as you know, what USDA has sort of said in that instance. Um, they come into these other programs where they're, you know, we've got thousands of acres protected in wetland reserve program right along the rivers down in um, the Addison Rutland border because of those types of situations where the flooding is so intense and the productivity and, and the yields were so low that it didn't make sense and the farmers acknowledged that. Um, so there is, there is a, a level of protection that exists amongst the programs themselves to make sure that, you know, we aren't just continually growing resources <coughs> something that isn't functional. And farmers, of course, you know, the work it takes to, to do that, it isn't as well functional to them. So I don't know that I would say either, you know, just we're, we're just loading phosphorus in these areas. Um, annual floodplains is one term. You know, I think you gotta be careful with what are you talking about? Because there are 100-year floodplains and there are annual year floodplains, and they are very far apart in terms of the timing of which they might, and a flood act might happen. And so to work <coughs> on managing within those lands, I think it's really important to make sure that you're clear because the impact of potential nutrient loading is very different based on the flooding situation. And then I just am wondering, um, we often get questions from constituents on sludge spreading. And can you just remind <coughs> us what the notification requirements are for that? And so I encourage you to talk to DEC, but my understanding is there's very few sites, I want to say somewhere between three and five, there's very few, um, that actually do that in the state of Vermont on agricultural lands. Um, and they regulate that from the nutrient management plan to the activity, to the timing, to the monitoring, they do all of that. Um, where we have farms that are taking crops off of that land, the farms need to report the, the import of that information in their NMP, but it is a separate management of the sludge versus the farm. Did you Oh, I, I just, uh, I'm pleased with the discussion. You're asking some really good questions, and, uh, you know, most of them uh, have, have good answers. And um, this one, you know, it's from the sludge. That isn't an agency of ag program. That's a program that DEC runs. And, uh, but what Laura was just saying was that even though there is some phosphorus and <coughs> nutrients going on to that property through the sludge. It has to be accounted for in a nutrient management plan. Through, so, through DEC side, they they make sure they do monitoring and testing and watch that. It's yeah, but you you also do uh, because of all the nutrient management plans are under your program, right? <coughs> sure, but a lot of times what the situation will be is that the farm might be only responsible to plant corn and harvest corn, but they don't do any nutrient applications. So therefore, it would just solely be a DEC situation. Because a lot of times you're not adding manure and sludge, right? I don't think I've ever seen that. Um, and I don't, honestly, I don't know the DEC rules well enough to know that whether that is even allowed to have an additional nutrient source added to where they're already doing sludge management. It may be restricted to just sludge management, which may be why I've never seen it. So it's definitely a question for DEC. Do you have one more question? Yep, I do. And, and, and actually, it's not so much a question for you or Diane, but a, but a comment just to build on on the paradigm of annual crops in our alluvial soils. You heard me talk about that at the joint hearing uh, several weeks ago. And we aren't going to regulate our way out of that, but paradigm changes, I believe, need to happen. And, and um, yes, I totally understand you go to Fort Collins, the, the results you're going to get are going to be four years old, and they were a snapshot in time then. And um, some of my favorite farmers have rotated their crops twice since then, and I get it. Um, but um, I think we, I, I think we just need to make incentives for different crops in there, total adjustable nutrients, uh, legumes, 
are actually higher than they are from corn. Um, I understand why we do corn, <laughs> just the same, but um, by volume, we, we need to switch that practice and, and not just whatever. Into the future, um, these practices need to change and we can hope that it wouldn't be a regulatory thing. Yeah, I definitely encourage to talk to some farmers that manage some floodplain land. I think they get some really interesting testimony on what choices they make and why they make them. And they're, um, they're definitely they're very thoughtful about well, that. Well, of because course they are. Investment. Of course they are. And 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 um, I've got several personal friends that are doing that, and they're doing a great job under the paradigm today. But if you drive from the west coast to Montpelier, or along any waterway, of course we're raising our annual crops in the most arable, level, fertile <laughs> grounds that we've got. And those, by definition, are what we're talking about. Thank and, you very much. I don't and, and that would include row crop vegetables. But yep, it, it, it absolutely does. Yep. As well. Yeah. Absolutely. So we, we talk a lot about dairy today, majority, and but the uh, if you we're starting to regulate produce because of the Food Safety Modernization Act, and those produce growers that are over 500,000 in gross sales have to be fully regulated. And we find they're all in those oh, yeah, lands oh, because yeah. they're most fertile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, Anything of size and scale is are in those lands. Yeah. And I think the challenge is the only map layer you have is a 100 year plus down layer. Yeah. Really. Um, everything else is an estimate. Um, there is no annual floodplain layer. It doesn't exist. So trying to figure out, especially what's in between there, there's certainly soil layers, but soil layers are at the three acre scale when you come to mapping them. They're not accurate. You know, the, um, the alluvial erosion hazard and the beltwood concept, like I said, Mike Klein can talk a lot more about that for you. There's a lot of science behind it, but again, it's dynamic and it's moving and all it takes is an Irene to shift some of that stuff in some instances. So there is no wonderful magic tool to be in this space for regulatory purposes. There are good guidance practices, good management recommendations that people can work with, but to, to have a bright line where you say, that's not allowed because of this, it is more difficult to find that space. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> Quick question, and we have to move on to uh, and, <coughs> and maybe if you want to get back to me on this, but curious to know if we are building to a standard, given that we're vulnerable to climate, and we want to make sure that that agricultural production is as resilient as it can be the future flooding. Uh, I've learned that some states have adopted, uh, have avoided the what they call technical paper <coughs> TP40, which is a 1950s document for determining uh, whether it's a, um, your engineering standards are built to 25 year flood <coughs> event. Um, but the, relying on TP40 is uh, 1950 data. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's already may not be the best, most current information for helping when you're building structures, farming structures, whether it's manure pit or silage leachate uh, control, whether you're building it towards a, in a manner that helps to ensure resilience. Yeah, um, so what are we doing in the state of Vermont? So it's, it's somewhat different than floodplain management because again, you most likely aren't able to build these structures in the floodplain. But as far as climate change and thinking ahead about when we design infrastructure, NRCS is who we, which is the federal partner of the agency of ag, who we rely on to make the standards. All of those standards are right now being revised to include new rainfall, which means that storages are gonna get bigger, farmers are going to have more water and management there of it. So that's the reality is that those numbers have gone up and they're adjusting it. So the technical engineering standards are all being revised. And what's your time frame? Okay. You'd have to ask um, Rob Achilles. I don't know, but I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's either currently developed and about to be rolled out or still in that development process. And we should wait for that in your mind because some states have adopted their own it, it already, standards. In our rules it says you must meet the current NRCS standards. So it'll naturally just when it rolls out, it rolls out. Okay. Thank you. It'll be the regulatory standards. Thank you very much, and thank you for um, <coughs> providing this, the English summary. Of the the English summary is great, right? It's funny to read this and realize how bureaucratic we are. <laughs> very helpful. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Costa. Sorry.
I'm Billy Koster. I'm the Director of Planning for the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. Thank you very much for having me in here to speak to the critical resource area provisions of um, your committee bill, bill in Act 250. Uh, I'm going to spend most of my time talking about that piece of the bill, but I thought I'd give you just a real brief overview of the Agency of Natural Resources and our, our work in Act 250. Um, Act, a and R is a statutory party to, to Act 250. That means that um, by law, any Act 250 application that implicates the natural resources criteria, uh, we have the ability to participate as a party. Um, so we review all Act 250 applications that are filed with district commissions around the state and assess whether there's significant natural resource impacts proposed. If so, we um, put comments into Act 250 district commissions uh, suggesting how to minimize and mitigate those impacts. Um, we also are required by statute to provide technical assistance to uh, the Natural Resources Board and its district commissions. Uh, that's codified in the Natural Resources Board Rule 21. So we will occasionally get specific requests from district commissions uh, to address questions that they have for some of the applications that are before them. So that's a, a separate role that we play beyond a, a being a party. Um, as you likely know, the agency uh, consists of three departments. Uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation, which is the primary regulatory body, Fish, uh, the Fish and Wildlife Department that uh, does a number of things from regulatory outreach and addressing our, our game species, and the Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation that is our largest land manager of state forest parks and uh, focuses on the forestry sector and increasingly on outdoor recreation. Um, staff from all three of those departments participate in the review of Act 250 applications. Each of those departments have regulatory review staff that play uh, their own unique role in, in looking at Act 250 projects. And that review is all coordinated through my office, the Office of Planning. Um, and we push applications materials out to the agency. We consolidate their review comments. We um, you know, make sure they're consistent across the agency. And then we work directly with applicants and district commissions uh, in the review of those projects. Um, as you know, the agency also has our own regulatory jurisdiction, primarily through DEC, and we issue permits uh, addressing impacts to things like surface water, wetlands, um, stormwater, rivers, a whole range of, of, of media. And you've already heard from uh, staff from the Fish and Wildlife Department uh, testifying on this bill. And you'll hear from folks from the Rivers Program later today or tomorrow, and likely others from, from our agency. But this is just a reminder that we all are under the umbrella of ANR and work together in, in reviewing Act 250. And we play a similar role um, in reviewing Section 248 petitions before the Public Utility Commission. So we're probably the most active state agency in, in Act 250. And we take great pride in that. It's a really important part of the state's regulatory landscape. Um, it, it is a, a gap filler in some ways, and we really rely on it, especially to protect um, fish and wildlife resources. Um, and I'm, I apologize, I'm just getting to the point in my life where I'm having these reading glasses, so I'm trying to figure out how to do that and talk to people at the same time. Um, so, you know, your committee bill does a, a number of things, as, as you're likely aware. It proposes changes to jurisdiction of Act 250, which controls when Act 250 review is triggered, um, changes to the criteria, which is kind of what things you're looking at, where the substantive um, considerations that are being made when Act 250 is reviewing the project. It proposes changes to the, the, the board structure, appeals, a whole host of things. Um, and the critical resource areas is primarily, in, in my view, a jurisdictional piece. It, 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 impacts when Act 250 jurisdiction would come into play, when district commissions would review different sorts of development. Um, and I also want to say right off the bat that I know that this committee and the bill is very interested in forest integrity and addressing issues of forest fragmentation. That's a, a significant priority for our agency as well. It has been for many years. And I know you'll hear from uh, Commissioner Snyder from the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation probably next week to talk in more detail on that issue. Um, but, but that is a, a big priority for us. Uh, we acknowledge that Act 250 currently lacks criteria sufficient to address impacts to forest blocks of connecting habitat. Um, if, we, if, if anything comes out of this process, we would like to see um, criteria allowing Act 250 to review those impacts because we believe that that's very important. Um, 
but it's our position that regulatory protections is only one strategy to address forest fragmentation. It's certainly an important one. Um, other strategies include planning, and we've made good uh, advances um, in this state around planning for forest integrity. Uh, the legislature enacted Act 70, 171 a year or two ago that um, required regional planning commissions to address forest fragmentation in their regional plans and authorized municipalities to do so. And we've seen lots of progress in that regard. And then, um, you know, probably the most significant strategy to address forest fragmentation is the maintenance of a viable forest products industry. Um, if a landowner can own a large block of unfragmented forest and they can harvest that land sustainably and make an annual make a revenue off that land, then it's in their financial interest to keep it undeveloped. If the highest and best use of that property maintains sustainable forest manage, management, it's not going to be fragmented for houses, it's not going to be subdivided into other lots. It's going to stay uh, in forest. And we've been very fortunate that uh, we have many landowners um, in Vermont who have kept their land in that state. While um, the, the amount of forest has declined slightly in recent years, we still have a significant amount of forested acres. And that is largely the result of these decisions of private landowners to manage their, their property for, for forest products. And um, we're, we're seeing a real threat to that, vi the viability of that sector these days from uh, global influences, but also the, the loss of a lot of in-state capacity to process those wood products and to value-added products. We're, we're seeing a number of uh, sawmills and other processing facilities go out. Um, Seth Jensen testified earlier this morning to you all that in his county, several mills have, have closed recently. Um, so we would really hope, as, as he suggested, that um, you look at the impact of Act 250 on those facilities and uh, do what you can to support the forest processing industry because that's a real key strategy in, in fighting forest fragmentation. Um, so now I'm going to turn to the definition of critical resource area, which is in your bill. I'm looking at uh, draft 5.2, which I believe is, is the latest. And um, that definition is on page 12. And it's, it's short, so I'll just read it. <coughs> Critical resource area means a river corridor, a significant wetland, as defined under section 902 of this title, land at or above 2,000 feet, and land characterized by slopes greater than 15% and shallow, de and shallow depth to bedrock. Um, that is a new definition that the bill adds to Act 250, and that definition is used in different ways to trigger jurisdiction. And I'm just going to hit on those different applications of the concept and then talk about um, you know our view of, of, of that and then and, and then take your questions. So the first um, use of that term comes on page six of the bill, line 18. Um, and in that provision um, the bill effectively establishes automatic and universal jurisdiction um, for the construction of any improvement for commercial, industrial, or residential use um, in a critical resource area, including areas above 2,000 feet. So that basically says, if you're doing any sort of construction of an improvement in these areas, Act 250 is automatically triggered. Um, it doesn't um, look at the scope or scale of the project, the area is impacted. It just says if, if those activities are occurring in these areas, Act 250 is automatically triggered. As you heard from the Natural Resources Board, um, you know, Act 250 typically is triggered by the size of the parcel, the number of lots, um, the scope of development. Um, except for areas above 2,500 feet, then um, Act 250 is automatically triggered. Um, this critical resource area concept brings that automatic universal trigger to these areas as well. Um, going on to page seven. Um, critical resource areas are referenced again starting on page six, excuse me, line six. Um, and this effectively, this section repeals the exemption for farming, logging, and forestry in critical resource areas and in areas above 2,000 feet. So currently, uh, farming, forestry, and logging are exempt for Act, from Act 250 unless they occur above 2,500 feet. Um, this provision would lower that elevational threshold to 2,000 feet and repeal the exemption in the other areas that are included in the definition. Um, 
and I'll, I'll, I'll and and we've done. Um, Chair Sheldon has asked us to do some mapping to to share information with you all about what those elevational breaks look like and how much land is included, say above 1,500 feet, above 2,000. We're going to get you that information next week. I do have some preliminary numbers, and changing that threshold from 2,500 feet to 2,000 feet adds another 513,000 acres to Act 250 jurisdictions. How much? 513,000 acres. Um, under the current law, that automatic jurisdiction is triggered at the 2,500 foot level. In all of Vermont, there's only about 190,000 acres above 2,500 feet. Okay. 2,500 feet. So if you drop that threshold to 2,000, you're going to pull in an additional 500,000. That's a you know almost a quadrupling of the area that would be subject to automatic universal jurisdiction. Um, let's see. And then um, the last section I'll point out is on page 10 of the bill, line 1. And uh, this speaks to subdivisions. Um, so the first two church jurisdictional triggers were focused on activities, you know, the construction of improvements or logging or farming. Um, this section talks about triggering Act 250 for subdivision. And uh, what this section does would say that um, Act 250 jurisdiction would be triggered for any subdivision, um, including dividing one parcel into two. Um, currently in Act 250, um, subdivisions trigger review if you're creating more than 10 lots or more in towns that have permanent zoning and subdivision bylaws, or six lots or more in towns that do not have those local provisions. So, um, you know, in towns that have planning and zoning, uh, you have to get above nine lots to trigger 250. In towns that don't, you have to get above five lots. Uh, this change would trigger Act 250 for just one subdivision if it's in these critical resource areas, um, including lands above 2,000 feet. And then there's a couple other references throughout the bill to critical resource areas um, that require they be considered in an updated capabilities and development map and that um, regional planning commissions uh, include them in, in their regional plans. Um, I'm not going to speak to those. Those are uh, su suggestions related to the planning provisions of the bill. Um, so now I, d I just want to kind of go back to the definition itself and talk about some of the components. Um, you know, the first critical resource area in mentioned are river corridors. And there was some discussion of river corridors earlier today with the Ag Agency. Uh, you'll hear from our rivers program uh, later who can speak in great detail about river corridors. Um, but I guess my point is that as currently drafted, this provision raises some questions because River corridors occupy a portion of land. So if you own, say, a 10-acre parcel that abuts a river, and that river corridor extends you know, 50 feet, 100 feet from the river onto your property, um, is your whole parcel going to be subject to Act 250 jurisdiction if you propose to build on it? Um, currently, 250 is usually triggered for the parcel, not by portions of. Um, so it's just unclear to us whether if you have a river corridor on your property, whether you fall into this critical resource area and Act 250 would be, be triggered. Or if the intent is that if you're only planning to build in the river corridor, then it's triggered. So that seems like something that warrants some clarification. Um, and I guess another question we have is whether all of Act 250's 10 criteria would apply in those instances. If your main concern here is addressing impacts to river corridors, um, inundation, and fluvial hazards. Um, and, and that is going to be triggered for something as small as a single family home, um, or for forestry, <coughs> or for farming in these areas. Does that level of development really warrant the full Act 250 review? Or is the intent just to focus on impacts to river corridors? Um, if the intent is just to focus on river cores, there, there may be better ways to do that. Um, there exists a state flood hazard and river corridor rule and permit that is required for some forms of development. It's not currently required for development that goes through Act 250, but that's an existing regulatory program, just like our stormwater, like our wetlands, 
program stream alteration that could easily be um, expanded to address these sorts of impacts without having to pull these small areas of development into Act 250. So that's an alternate approach that, that certainly exists. Um, the second element of um, the critical resource area definition is significant wetlands. And these are class uh, one and two wetlands. The state has broken wetlands into three classes, one, two, and three. <coughs> class one being really outstanding significant resources. There's only a handful of those that have been designated in the state. Class two are state significant um, due to their size or their functions and values. Class three are typically smaller, more scattered, and while valuable, they're not regulated by the state. So this, this focuses on those two more significant classes of wetlands. Um, the same question applies. If you have a significant wetland on your property, does that automatically pull the whole parcel into Act 250 jurisdiction under this approach? Or is it only if you're going to impact the wetland? Um, that's not clear to us. Um, another issue is that wetlands um, are <coughs> dynamic in nature, and they're not accurately mapped currently across the state. So this approach would suggest needing a wetland delineation um, before you do any form of development to determine whether a class two wetland is, uh, a significant wetland is present on your property um, so that you know whether jurisdiction is triggered. Um, wetland delineations, wetland assessments are typically done for larger developments, um, but not everyone knows they need to do that, especially if you're bringing um, the threshold down to uh, a, a single family house. It's not a, a bad idea to, to vet properties for wetlands. We certainly support that. Um, but it could create just additional complexity at the very beginning stages of the Act 250 process just to determine if, if jurisdiction applies. So that's another consideration for you. And then similarly, we have state statutory protections for significant wetlands. And there's rules that have been uh, promulgated and we have a robust wetland permitting program that is already reviewing impacts to these resources. Um, so it's not entirely clear what the intent of triggering the full robust Act 250 review um, if you're really just focused on protecting wetlands because we have a wetlands program that's intended to do that. And if, if that program has gaps, we'd certainly be happy to talk to you about how to make it more robust. But um, it just raises the question whether the full suite of um, 250 process and criteria would be necessary if you're really focused on just well in the um, the, the next piece I'll touch on in, is uh, areas above 2,000 feet. Um, as I explained, Act 250 currently has automatic universal jurisdiction for areas above 2,500 feet. That would lower that threshold uh, 500 feet in elevation. Um, and as I said earlier, that equates to about 500,000, a little more than 500,000 acres. We're doing some additional analysis to determine, you know, what of that half a million acres is actually developable or operable for, for forestry, and, and we'll try to have that information for you next week. But it, it's still a significant land area. Um, and, and this gets me back to the, the forest fragmentation conversation. Because currently, um, landowners are able to harvest timber up to 2,500 feet without getting an Act 250 <coughs> application. And we see very few applications to harvest above that threshold. We get a few every few years. But it, it's, there's not a lot of timber management that occurs above 2,500 feet. It certainly happens, but it's not a regular activity. So I think most forest owners and, uh, and managers are, are not familiar with the Act 250 process. It would be a big change if they had to uh, get an Act 250 permit to manage some portion of that half a million acres. Um, and it, it could frankly be a deterrent uh, for them to do so. And that seems the exact opposite effect that you would like to have in, in promoting people to keep large blocks of unfragmented forest in, in active, sustainable management. Um, I think requiring people to get Act 250 permits in that half a million acres for forestry um, could really work in the opposite direction and encourage people to seek a different use of that property. If they're going to have to get an Act 250 permit, you might as well get it for a couple houses while you're at it to do it for your timber operation. So that's just a concern. You might want to talk to forest landowners and the folks that advise them to get a better sense of how much of a hurdle that could be. 
But we have real concerns that lowering that threshold to 2,000 feet could have the unintended consequence of deterring um, forest management, which is our best strategy in preventing forest fragmentation. And I think as others testified, elevation is not always the best proxy for sensitivity. Um, I think it's, it's a pretty coarse, coarse one. There, there may be better ways to determine what areas are, are more vulnerable from a natural resources perspective. Um, and then the last piece that um, the definition includes is slopes greater than 15% on shallow bedrock. Um, you know, that sounds reasonable. I know that building on, on steep slopes is, can be problematic. Again, I think there are another, a number of regulatory protections out there through our state stormwater program that, that does address that issue. Um, and, you know, I don't really have a strong opinion on that one, but I, I think, again, it will be a, a, a granular analysis that will be need, that will be necessary at the beginning of the development <coughs> process to determine if, if those features exist on the site and whether they um, would then trigger activity. So, you know, in summary, uh, the agency does not support this approach to jurisdiction, um, you know, largely due to the, the reasons that I um, just summarized. Um, you know, we, we think that there's some confusion about how the river corridor and well pieces would be applied in practice. Um, if the intent is to apply them just narrowly to those resource areas, it would appear other uh, restrictions and provisions of state law already exist that could, could do that work easily. Um, dropping the elevational trigger um, may have significant impacts on uh, ongoing forestry operations in the state, which is a concern of ours. Um, so that is, you know, basically the, the, the bulk of, of my testimony today. I think that, um, you know, we're certainly open to discussing alternate approaches to jurisdiction, but as far as the critical resource areas as proposed, it's, it's not something that we think is, is, is the way to go. Representative Yeah, I think the fact that you say you're not supporting these changes kind of answers my question. Yeah. Representative Odie? Well, two questions. One is big, which is, okay, if, if one thing is possibly, one possible change is too large, how would you answer that to make it not too large? And maybe that is the answer to my second question, which is, well, what do you propose now? Sure, so if the committee is interested in expanding Act 250 jurisdiction um, to address sensitive natural resource areas, um, the proposal we made to the Act 47 Commission, which was the, you know, as you know, the, the legislative process that went on for the past year or so that Chair Sheldon and Representative Lafay were on, our recommendation to that commission was to um, establish what was effect what's effectively a petition process, where through rulemaking, um, entities, a, a town, uh, a citizen, a nonprofit, um, a conservation group, a regional planning commission could propose to the Secretary of Natural Resources that a, that a discrete defined area had unique natural resource values that warrant higher jurisdiction. So that you would not create a blanket increase across the state, but you would go in on a case by case basis and say, this. 100 acres is a regionally um, acknowledged um, corridor for wildlife. Even a single home developed in this area could have detrimental impacts on those functions and values. We really feel that automatic and uni universal Act 250 review in this area is warranted. And here's the scientific and planning argument for why that is. Um, there would be some criteria developed uh, that would inform when those areas would be designated or not. I would be, we go through a public process where, where folks could provide comments and then an issue, a decision would be rendered. There's similar models that exist in the state for uh, outstanding resource waters and class one wetlands. These are other um, ways to identify premier natural resources through a um, petition and designation process that then uh, enjoy higher protection. So that's our current proposal. We're absolutely open to talk with you all and other stakeholders about different ways to get there, but that's our current thing. Well, would you ever consider, since instead of having people kind of 
And are those anyone, as in anyone Vermonters only, or anyone whatever? But, but that's one question. But the, instead of having all this pump up going on, don't you have a? Wouldn't you have kind of? Why not make a proposal for which lands and why, and get it done once? Because it's not a simple proposition. You know, I think this concept of increasing jurisdiction for Act 50 has been discussed as long as I've been at the agency, which is over seven years now, and, and no one's come up with that silver bullet. Um, and I think we're absolutely willing to continue talking with people. I know VNRC has been working hard on this issue for many, many years, and I think is was scheduled to propose something to you all yesterday. They're gonna come in tomorrow to do so. I'm eager to see what they have to say, and that may be um, of course that we're able to support but um, we didn't if, if the goal is to address forest fragmentation and connectivity um, we don't currently have the tools to say right now here are those places in the landscape that are so critical they need enhanced um, protections it's not to say that we, we can't get there eventually but we don't have that figured out right this second so our thought is that this petition process lets the areas creates a, a process to um, identify and protect those areas as they are determined to exist on the landscape. Representative Dolan. Good morning. Uh, my question was uh, earlier in your presentation when you talked about um, forest, uh, the forest products industry, and you had mentioned that, um, you brought up the case where we heard earlier about in Memorial that seven, several mills closed. And um, so you saw that um, <clears throat> the threat of um, how to uh, provide for a, a, um, the uh, processing for forest products industry. And you had some ideas on that. I, I'm, I'd be very interested in hearing from you sure. about how Vermont could go about uh, attracting those types of businesses and scale for Vermont that can help support that industry. And I don't know if you have ideas now um, or at some point, but yeah, I just I, wanted to flag that as a follow-up. Certainly. I, I can share one idea right now, and I would suggest you wait, hold off until Commissioner Snyder testifies, because I think he will be able to speak to that in a much more complete and eloquent way. But certainly one piece that um, we've acknowledged um, could be addressed through Act 250 is um, restrictions on the time of operation for forest processing facilities. Um, it's increasingly hard with climate change for um, foresters, loggers, truckers to bring um, forest products out of, the, out of the woods safely under dry or frozen conditions um, and deliver them to mills to be processed. Uh, it used to be that you could bank on having a nice long winter when you could freeze up your forest roads and move wood, you know, nine to five during normal business days. Now with the weather we've been having, this week is a great example. Sometimes you have short windows of safe conditions and you have to go all night for days to get that wood out and then you lose your window. Similarly during the winter, during the summer, we have lots of rain sometimes. You may only have a, a brief dry spell to, to move wood. And um, we've seen some mills uh, have restrictions on when they can receive shipments of forest products in their activity permits. And, we'd ask you to, to look at whether um, there can be some accommodations made for mills to have some reasonable flexibility to work with the weather and not be constrained um, by hours of operation when they really need to, to move the product. So that's one simple one, but I'm sure Mike can give you a lot more um, ideas. Representative McCullough. I'm not wanting to shoot the messenger, Billy. I appreciate your coming here um, and giving us a preview, perhaps, of the administration's approach to um, modifying Act 250. Uh, frankly, that disturbs me. Um, for our natural resource is planning division to um, be not supporting critical um, resource areas, definitions, and and exploration of this um, um, is quite troubling. Uh, I, I, I understand you're willing to keep talking. You've said that half a dozen times today. Um, but um, with that, 
I'd like you to just take the word back to the fifth floor that the rest of the agencies need to come out of the woodwork and tell us up front, yes, we're supporting this section, or no, we're not supporting that, or you know what? This has been a great exercise, but thank you, but no thank you. This committee needs to know, and, and um, uh, we need to know in detail. So you've given us some detail, um, and uh, I, I appreciate that. I'd like your planning agency to rethink your position that perhaps planning is not as, as I read what you said today, planning is um, not as good as each, each little part deciding do we need to increase our regulations, do we need to look at this a little bit differently. Um, we're talking about a planning document here specifically for the entire state and and um, so that's my pitch. You don't even need to respond. Thank you very much for listening. I, I just want to respond briefly and say that, you know, planning is critical. And I didn't focus a lot on the planning provisions of your committee bill today, but I think certainly doing more to identify where natural resources are in the landscape and inform people in their development decisions and it is critical. And I think Act 171 has been very successful in that. It, it, it authorized towns and regions to plan for forest blocks and connecting habitat. We've developed a whole curriculum and model bylaws for communities to do that work with, and, and that's happening all across the state, and these issues are being um, regulated at a local level, and I, I think that's a great outcome, and mm -hmm. I certainly support planning at the statewide level, so I, I hope I, I, I didn't mean to suggest otherwise. I think just mm -hmm. the specific language of the critical resource areas as currently drafted um, raises some problems for us. Well, this, so, this representative would actually be adding some other critical resource areas definitions. Of course, all the way to the far end is a vernal pool. Is this 250 square foot thing worth protecting? And and how do we, and of course we have regulations around that. But at any rate, thank you. So I guess I'm following up on that. I'm I'm wondering, do you? Is it the position of the agency that there are not statewide significant resources that we should be protecting? No, we, there certainly are. There's statewide significant natural communities. There's all statewide significant wetlands. There, there's a whole litany of resources that are statewide significant. I think my only comment is that this definition as a jurisdictional trigger has potential issues, unintended consequences. It's not clear how it will be applied to either just that specific location of the so, entire but parcel. Just what would those resources be? And how would you identify them? I, I'd have to get back to that because there are a number of resources that through statute and rule have already been designated as state significant. Um, we have a whole ranking system for natural communities that I can get back to you on. Wetlands, class one and two are already considered state significant. So I, I don't know the answer off the top of my head. I mean, I guess but I would just also say that the concept of having things come from the bottom up has been pretty slow on class one wetlands, river corridor protections. It's not something that's proving out to be working that well. Um, and again, absolutely open to talking with folks. Um, we're, we're actively engaged with BNRC around this issue right now. How do we come up? Is, is there a path to increase jurisdiction outside of centers that is workable for all stakeholders? Um, and we're, we're still working on it. Um, my line of questioning is along that same theme. Uh, I, I was intrigued by your um, suggestion or um, identification of alternative models to try to accomplish the same objective. And you mentioned this petition and designation process, so I, I appreciate that. It gives us something to think about. Uh, I would be interested in, maybe you could follow up with us with getting us some of this information. Um, the, the petition and uh, process that we have in place, if you could provide us some data in terms of how effective it has been in both the um, wetland class one designation, <coughs> and you mentioned outstanding resource water. How many? How many do we have? Um, the the reason why we're kind of um, concerned is that earlier in this whole process, we heard about um, the climate impacts 
and how and where Vermont and its in its various mountain ranges and river systems, how important it is to be thinking about that connectivity issue um, about forest blocks and the connected habitat, and how I think we as a collective in the state are trying to wrestle with that level of lift necessary as we think about Act 250 and that next iteration and what that looks like. And, and the maps, I think, were very telling in that much of our landscape, as you know, is in private land ownership and how important it is to engage the public in, in embracing that vision of our future being robust and vibrant, both ecologically and economically. And so we're, we're struggling with trying to figure out those tools that are going to help us really um, acknowledge and realize how to um, bring us forward into uh, aligned in that vision that can protect um, these uh, forest blocks and connected habitat. So, so that example is helpful. If you have other examples in which we can help acknowledge. Um, and if I, when we get to that whole um, 2000 to 2500, uh, we're, we're fortunate that we have some areas with um, higher mountain range, maybe not Rocky Mountain version, but uh, but certainly our green hills are something to embrace. Uh, but we, we recognize in other places in the state we have smaller mountain ranges that may not necessarily even reach that 2,500, but, but elevation does matter, especially when we're thinking about forest blocks and connectivity. And, and I've driven through, I think we all have, through the Vermont landscape where we've seen uh, the beautiful hills and mountains um, that, uh, with no zoning, where they have development on the top of the mountain ranges there. And, uh, and maybe, you, you know, we, if you think Act 250 is just slowing the inevitable development, um, that's unfortunate. You know, we, we want to really be deliberative, and those planning processes are critical for us, and enabling us to see how, again, thinking of forest block and connected habitat throughout Vermont, how um, important it is for us to be kind of um, having the tools in place to help us address us address those those um, that the, those uh, challenges <coughs> so oh, I'm very much welcome your your other ideas on how to uh, accomplish those objectives <coughs> given the level of lift. We'll share those and just briefly you know we absolutely support modernizing the criteria to address forest blocks connecting habitat we've suggested <coughs> ways to modernize the floodways criteria to be protective of river corridors and the connectivity that those riparian areas provide so we share those goals, absolutely. Um, I think this narrow subject we discussed today is a jurisdictional one, and I think it just raises some questions for us. And, and elevation absolutely does matter. What I, what I meant to imply is that 2,000 feet is not a magic number. In some communities, you might not ever hit that height, but there's ridges and mountains that are significant. In other places, 2,000 feet is a flat, it's, it's your whole community. It's like Marshfield, almost, so or that's 1,500 feet. So it's it's just picking a number is not always the best way to get there. Um, and our biggest concern with um, this proposal is the uh, rescinding the forestry exemption in that area between 2,000 and 2,500. That's what gives us the greatest pause because that may discourage um, landowners from, from doing good forest management in those areas that are, are, are appropriate for forestry and may lead to conversion to other uses, which is absolutely what we're trying to avoid. Representative Dave. Uh, thank you, Billy. I was very encouraged to hear what you had to say about how the forest industry is a, plays a key role in preventing fragmentation. Uh, I certainly uh, see it as a, uh, that industry is keeping these small towns in my neck of the woods viable, and uh, and I I would hate to see any more obstacles put in their way, and uh, I would rather have a sense that the two can work hand in hand as far as preventing fragmentation and also having a very healthy uh, forest industry. And I'm hoping that such uh, concepts as uh, as uh, location jurisdiction. And, uh, uh, and uh, enhanced designation, if you will, in these areas will play a role in determining, you know, what kind of flexibility we can give uh, in terms of how we, in terms of how we uh, uh, relate to the working land. So I was very, very, very happy to hear your testimony. Thank you. Harvey? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment. Uh, I'm not sure what the protocol is for witnesses to come in and speak, but. I appreciate your candor. 
I appreciate the, the issues that you brought up. I appreciate uh, we're thinking about the impact of this changes on you know the working lands, and I, I think uh, you know I'm still struggling with the critical resource areas that are out there and understanding what the impact that's going to have on agriculture and forestry. And uh, so I, I appreciate the fact that, that you came and brought that to our attention. Representative Corgan. Yeah, I just would like to follow up on <coughs> what Representative Smith said. Um, I see it that we have we have witnesses in here to give us their opinions on this bill. And this bill, well, this committee bill, isn't anything a set in stone. It's a, isn't anything that this committee that I'm aware of has decided this is the way the wording's going to be. And again, I appreciate the fact that you're of, of receiving your your opinions, whether we end up agreeing with them or not. Thank you. That's your opinion. Um, I'm wondering if you, as a planner, have you put any thought into how we address the sort of cumulative effects of incremental development if we aren't going to change jurisdictional terms? I have thought about that. Um, I haven't come to any great conclusions. Um, you know, this is the this is a real challenge. How do you create a regulatory structure that um, can account for that incremental growth that doesn't just kind of swoop in at some point in time? And it's kind of like there's the, the there used to be this concept as last last person in in Act 250 under the transportation criteria, where you could build out on a on a part of a road, and the the next development that necessitated an extra turning lane or a traffic light, they had to pay for all those improvements. Where it was really the cumulative impact of cars from all that development that got to that point that contributed to it. Um, but it was you know whoever that last developer was who you know, hit that threshold, it was all on them. Um, VTrans changed that model by um, charging a small amount from every person along a roadway, um, anticipating needing to make future investments and, and, and sh spreading that cost around. Um, but, but that's harder when you're trying to make land use decisions. So I don't have a good answer to that. Um, it's something that I continue to think about and struggle with. I think it would be great to have um, you know, some professional planners who have done this work in Vermont for a long time to uh, discuss that issue with you. I know you've heard from them in the Act 47 commission process. Um, I think that that jurisdiction is a tool to get there. I think our proposal to um, increase jurisdiction in areas that have demonstrated values and demonstrated risk is one way to do that. Um, you know, the example I like to give is the Shootsville Hill Wildlife Corridor in Waterbury. Um, it's a, you look it on the map, it's a very obvious place, a very obvious linkage. Um, it has discrete barrier, or, you know, sideboards. It's, it's, it's this place on the landscape that you can point to and say, that's important. And even a small amount of development in an area could be detrimental. And I think that's the exact sort of place we envision for this petition process, where, where someone will come forward and say, this, this area on the landscape has outsized values, it has high vulnerability and risk from even small amounts of development. Um, let's have actually get the apply here broadly. Um, so that's one way to get a cumulative development, but you're, you're, you're focusing it on the areas that have the highest values and the most risk instead of just broadly across the landscape. But again, you know, I think there's a lot of smart people, smarter than I, working on this, and I'm hoping that um, others will bring ideas forward as, you know, in the course of this debate that we can talk about. Any more questions for Mr. Belter? Oh, related to that example, what triggered the Act 250 process in the first place in order to give you the opportunity <coughs> to recognize that this particular example was critical in both what we're trying, you know, as a, as a, um, a resource of high value? Yeah. So, so we know that it's important because of a number of 
studies that have occurred in the area of both Black Fish and Wildlife Department and Nature Conservancy others, but currently that area doesn't have any special regulatory protections. Act 250 would only trigger if the current jurisdictional thresholds were met. And I use that as an example for a petition process that I discussed earlier, where someone could come forward and say, this area is important, I'm going to petition for Act 250 to apply university here. So that was just an example of a place where the model I'm suggesting could work well. In this case, it was a cell tower, so that triggered the 248 well, process. Yeah. So let's say it was going to be a, this is Waterbury, so yeah. it would, they have adopted standards, so uh, they have zoning. And so let's say it would be um, ten, uh, six lots, six lots. Right. So what if it was a housing development, high elevation for four houses in that? So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't trigger 250 or anything. It wouldn't have triggered 250. And even if it did, and this is you know the biggest issue from RHC's perspective, there aren't criteria related to forest blocks and connecting habitat to 250. So even if it, a development in an area triggered Act 250 review, we wouldn't have the tools to address those considerations. We may be able to get to it through necessary wildlife habitat or some other of the environmental criteria, but there's no uh, lens currently to review these landscape scale values such as habitat blocks and connecting habitat. So let's say again, coming to this example, that um, it was a four lot subdivision and uh, we had adopted a connected um, forest block connectivity type standard mm -hmm. and yet it was four lots. So I presume it would still fly under our threshold if we hadn't done anything with jurisdictions. Correct. So, and I always think a good working forest, a good working farm is what we strive for. It does less impact from a well-managed forest, uh, you know, um, timber stand to a, a well-managed farm. So I think we can all agree that's an objective. Land conversion into new housing, it never, you can never undo. And, and yet here we have, in this situation, the type of development triggered review that gave the state the opportunity <coughs> to flag it as an absolutely critical juncture. So that's what we're, we're trying to get at, is um, those situations, because nine times out of 10, it's a housing development. How do we, a, 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 a petition process may help, but you have to be really have foresight in determining strategically how to plan that on a statewide basis. So that's a huge challenge. So um, how I welcome your recommendations of, of jurisdiction that can help us ensure that those areas of absolute critical importance are going to be lost. We'll, we'll continue working on that, and you know, as ideas come out um, that we think are good ones, I'm, I'm happy to, to bring them back to you and um, to, to talk more. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Welcome. Ready to get started? We are ready to get started. You're on the record. Good afternoon, Chairman, Chairwoman, Sheldon, and Committee. Thanks for having me here to talk about river corridors and agricultural practices in those areas. My name is Rob Evans. I am the River Corridor and Floodplain Protection Program Manager at the Agency of Natural Resources. Our program supports multiple jurisdictions that regulate development in flood hazard areas and river corridors, including municipal permitting, Act 250, and the state flood hazard area and river corridor rule. My prepared testimony will, one, give you a brief overview of the areas regulated, and also discuss current authority for regulating agricultural practices and river corridors. So to start, the areas regulated, direct attention to the, the screen up there, because I have some visuals still on my testimony. We'll talk about flood hazard areas first. The flood hazard area is a regulatory zone mapped by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It's the basis of the National Flood Insurance Program. The flood hazard area depicts the areas that would be inundated by the quote, 100 year flood, or more accurately, the 1% annual chance flood. 
Development in Mount Flood Hazard Areas is regulated by 90% of Vermont's communities that are enrolled in the National Flood Insurance Program, typically through zoning regulations. In addition, the Flood Hazard Area is regulated through Act 250 under Criterion 1D floodways, as well as the State Flood Hazard Area and River Corridor Rule. Municipalities and the state are required to regulate flood hazard areas in order to maintain access to federal flood insurance and hazard mitigation grants. The shortcoming of the flood hazard areas that does not account for the fact that rivers are dynamic and that they change location in their river valleys over time. Specifically, flood hazard areas do not account for flood-related erosion, which is Vermont's primary mode of flood damage. Moreover, 80% of Vermont's rivers and streams do not have a ma mapped flood hazard area. River corridors are mapped by the Agency of Natural Resources, my program in particular, and depict the space a river needs over time to accommodate erosion and depositional processes. River corridors are an important planning and regulatory tool to avoid putting new investments in hazardous places and to avoid the need to further channelize our rivers to protect those investments. Here's an image that shows both the flood hazard area and river corridor combined. As you can see, they don't exactly line up on the landscape. That's because the methodology that goes into creating those is distinctly different. It was based on calculations to determine what's going to be underwater during the 100-year flood. That's the red area that you see up there, reddish pink. The yellow corridor superimposed, the river corridor, is defining that lateral space the river needs over time. From meander migration down valley, rivers meander in alluvial valley settings. That's just fun physics. This image depicts a situation that is common in Vermont, a narrowly mapped flood hazard area that underrepresents flood risk. In this image, the flood hazard area does not extend beyond the banks of the river. This is due to the river being disconnected from its floodplain. Floodplain disconnection results from channelization practices, typically some combination of dredging, berming, armoring, and straightening. Channelization sets in motion a process referred to as incision, where the channel cuts down vertically, and larger and larger flood flows are contained within the channel, setting up an extremely erosive situation. Flood, flood should start spilling out onto the floodplain during the one to two year flood, allowing water to spread out, slow down, drop sediment, debris, sometimes ice, like this time of year. This is what we refer to as natural and beneficial floodplain functions. This image shows all of the 100-year flood being shunted downstream, putting public infrastructure and private investments at greater risk. The river corridor depicts the space a river needs to re-establish a stable slope, that's that meander geometry I referred to, and floodplain reconnection. The river corridor is an essential tool to ensure that investments are not placed in conflict with natural river processes. The river will restore itself if we provide the space. <coughs> 43 communities have voluntarily adopted river corridor regulations. In addition, the state of Vermont regulates river corridors through Act 250 and the flood hazard area river corridor rule. Before I move on to agricultural practices in river corridors and flood hazard areas, are there any questions about difference or distinction between these two mapped areas. One maps inundation risk, one is a tool to manage for erosion risk. Harvey. Yeah, could, could you explain that a little bit more as to the differences between the FEMA and the ANR? Sure. Does, in terms of just on this particular yeah, slide and, in particular. and how it works and how it's interrelated. Uh, yes, it is interrelated. If, if uh, you know, this, this situation we're seeing here where the FEMA floodplain, the red area is very narrowly mapped. It's essentially depicting the 100 year flood <coughs> contained within the channel of the river. If the river was not disconnected from its floodplain, we expect to see a place uh, shown in red at least as big as the river corridor, perhaps even larger, if it was accessing its floodplain, dissipating its energy, depositing its sediment. 
Um, and again, what typically creates that incision process where the river starts to erode downward and then it starts to erode laterally as well as channelization practices. It can also be a combination of upland changes to watershed hydrology as well. The river corridor, on the other hand, isn't looking at a one flood. It's saying, based on the science of geomorphology, how much space does that river need over time through a whole range of floods to discharge its flood water, its sediment, and be vertically stable. Vertically stable doesn't mean it's not going to move laterally over time, but vertically stable and least erosive. What we think of that as the minimum valley space that the river needs over time. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. Uh, you said 80% are not mapped of the flood hazard areas in the state. Don't we have, we have all those NFIP maps that are historic? And so that when you say not mapped, can you sort of explain what that means? Because I mean, the maps are done differently, right? Like they're all mapped, but some were surveyed, some weren't. Or uh, actually, no, that they're actually not all mapped. FEMA, due to just the cost of mapping, um, doing detailed studies and creating maps for, for rivers, really focuses on our larger main stems and those rivers, rivers and streams that are adjacent to populated areas or are experiencing development pressure. So, yeah, 80% of our stream miles do not have a FEMA map flow. Now, those are by and large, by the number of smaller rivers and streams. Um, you know, our big rivers and streams, the Otter, the Lamoille, the Winooski, and a number of the major tributaries like the Dog River, or the Mad River, those are mapped by FEMA. But tributaries to those rivers, not mapped. And, and flood risk does exist on those. Yes. And they're, we're not working on that on any level to map them. Uh, FEMA's back in the state after being on hiatus to update maps in the state, but it's still going to be a large percentage of streams without a FEMA. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll move on to discuss regulation of agricultural practices in river corridors. The flood hazard area and river corridor rule went into effect in March of 2015. The rule regulates activities that are exempt from municipal regulation. <coughs> Those activities that towns cannot regulate and that are regulated by the rule include state-owned and operated institutions and facilities, so state buildings, uh, that includes our uh, transportation infrastructure, in infrastructure uh, roads and bridges, culverts uh, that are in, in these areas. Um, and it also includes re uh, the regulation of required agricultural and forestry practices and power generation and transmission facilities that are subject to the Public Utility Commission process, also known as Section 248. The flood hazard area and river corridor general permit allows farming as a non-reporting activity when such activities do not involve the placement of structures or other above ground improvements or earthwork that permanently alters ground elevations, <coughs> fill, retaining walls, berms, terraces. Required agricultural practices in flood hazard areas need to meet a no adverse impact standard to ensure development does not increase flood elevations, velocities, or decrease flood storage volume. In addition, development needs to meet floodplain management standards, such as elevation, flood proofing requirements, anchoring, use of flood resistant materials. Those are base requirements of the National Flood Insurance Program that the state is on the hook for, just like to. Required agricultural <coughs> practices in river corridors need to meet a no adverse impact standard as well. Specifically, development cannot increase fluvial erosion hazards by creating a need to channelize or further channelize the river. River channelization typically in the form of stream bank armoring may increase river <coughs> stability, which exacerbates erosion hazards and sediment loading to receiving waters. Similar to densely developed designated centers, the rule contains provisions that allow for infill and redevelopment within the farm production area, so long as it's not any closer to the river than pre-existing development. And lastly, uh, the definitions and regulatory standards in the Flood Hazard Area and River Corridor rule align with standards in our agency procedure for making determinations and recommendations to Act 250 Criterion 1D. 
Unfortunately, the Act 250 criterion 1D definitions and standards and statute are antiquated and do not align with current practice, which makes it very confusing for the regulated community and leads to inefficiency in the overall permitting process. I would direct you for further reading to an addendum that we filed with our testimony um, entitled Rationale and Policy Support for Revisions to Act 250 Criterion 1D. It walks through the last 15 years of Supreme Court decisions, legislative acts, um, et cetera, uh, in terms of how we view and use river corridors in, in light of 1D determinations in the Act 250 process. So in closing, uh, the committee bill is currently drafted, modernizes the terms and standards, and brings them into alignment with current practice. So with that, I'll take questions. Representative Smith. Yeah, just looking at that uh, slide you have up there where you have the farm production area. And uh, so that looks like it's in the, the flood zone. Yes, sir, it would be in the flood zone as well. So if that farm wanted to make some improvements or changes, uh, what would the process be? They would uh, apply for a permit from my program, and then they would have to, again, meet standards. So to start with the floodplain area, um, they would have to ensure that the project is not decreasing flood storage volume. That's one of those no adverse impact standards. So if they wanted to elevate the ground and place fill, that might ultimately be permissible, but they'd have to offset that by excavating. Basically, the, the, the what we call a compensatory storage standard requires that they maintain space for flood water storage and conveyance. So that's the first big test. Um, if you can get over the no adverse impact hurdle, um, then, then it falls back to standards that are really tied to what it is you're doing. Are you building a barn? Um, if that, you're building a barn, that has to meet floodplain management criteria for elevation of the barn or wet flood proofing it. It requires things like having flood vents to allow water to equalize so you don't have you know collapse of walls due to uneven water pressure. It requires that you have utilities either elevated above the flood elevation or flood proof so they're dry when flood waters hit. Anchoring requirements, things that are floatable, things that can be moved downstream during floods need to be either enclosed or otherwise anchored to ensure that they don't become part of the debris field that pulses downstream and then we all pay for with our collective tax dollars to pick up somewhere else. Um, so that's so before I move on to river corridors, that's the kind of stuff we look at. It just kind of depends on what construct. Well, there, but you know, there are the historic buildings as well. I mean, a lot of them have been there for a long period of time. So I was wondering if if that was destroyed by fire or flood, um, whether it would be allowed to to build back or whether they'd have to find another location. Well, they would be allowed to build back, and, and you know, it's an interesting point to bring up regarding historic designation. Uh, historic designation, typically, let me just back up, if, so the, if a building, and we're talking about flood insurance program, those standards we need to administer, so it's really focused on insurable buildings. Um, when an insurable building is substantially damaged, 50% um, of the cost, essentially, uh, of replacing it, uh, so, or more, would cost of rebuild back if you trigger that substantial damage threshold normally that requires that you meet current standards um, so if you have to elevate it you can rebuild it but you have to elevate it and flood proof it in keeping the, the requirements historic buildings have a specific pass on that um, they're exempt from substantial damage requirements so uh, so if it truly was on either a state register or the national register of historic places and it was substantially damaged, there would be some additional relief granted to the building like that. Yep. So what would happen if they were expanding to meet some of the new uh, uh, water quality practice standards, you know, put in, uh, you know, look like they might have a more storage area there? Let's, uh, yeah, there is a large, fairly new concrete <coughs> manure pit there that were placed in earthen manure pit uh, NRCS funded it uh, just a few years ago and so you know it's a matter of installing implements to make sure that during floods that you're not going to have flood water backing up and further compromising that system you've got backflow preventers things like that the top of the manure pit needs to be above flood elevation 
uh, <coughs> design flood elevation um, with our rule is two feet above the 100 year flood elevation. Um, so again, flood proof, you don't want to have your, the, the overarching, kind of, without getting into the very specifics of the rule standards, is you don't want flood waters to compromise your investment and you don't want your investment to pollute or contaminate or compromise flood waters. It's important because uh, we've been, I've been really focused on this slide and what's required when we're talking about inundation hazards and inundation standards. Um, but there's also the lens of the river corridor. And so with the river corridor, um, you know, infilling within those existing buildings, replacing, modifying those existing buildings, not a problem. Even behind and further away from the river, what we call shadowing, um, would be allowed, kind of closer to the road there. Um, but the big test here is we don't want to see a new investment closer to the river because that might engender the need to start channelizing the river sooner or more to protect that new investment. So where I'm sitting, it looks like uh, if they had to put in a new facility or add on to that facility, they'd have to go to the left. Correct. Okay. But it would be allowed. Yes. Representative Morgan, did you say that FEMA determines the outer boundaries of the boundaries of the, the floodplain? Yes, the flood hazard area, the, the inundation <coughs> floodplain, they, they do the, the mapping and the studies. How do they determine what that is? Uh, it, it's a, basically a combination of hydrologic analysis, coming up with an estimation of what, how large it is the 100-year flood coming through here. And so that can be done a number of ways. Um, Typically, it's using screen gauging records to come up with a flood frequency. It's a statistical analysis to analyze stream flow records. Um, in the absence of stream flow records, the uh, U.S. Geological <coughs> Survey has come up with uh, what they call regression equations, where they use large data set from all of our gauges in both Vermont, New Hampshire, and even part of New York to come up with predictive equations to, to estimate flood flows um, in the absence of stream flow data. And then you can also do, FEMA doesn't typically do this because it's very expensive, um, is rainfall runoff modeling, where you look at precipitation inputs, land cover, land use, uh, with perviousness, and then you can generate a, a runoff discharge a flow, a flood flow from that. That's the first step. Then once you have a flood flow, then you have to uh, put that into what's called a hydraulic model. Um, and essentially what you do is you, you survey, or in this case, with high resolution topography like we have in the state. LIDAR, I don't know if you've heard of that, but basically shows at high resolution what the elevation of the landscape is. So you essentially take cross sections perpendicular to flow of the channel and floodplain. So you define the geometry at regular intervals down and upstream. And then you simulate flood flow through that geometry and then you can determine how high or low the flood water gets. And you take into consideration same thing, kind of land cover, land use, you know, is it heavily forested? Is it paved? Is it mowed? All those things have a, an effect on flood water behavior. So. Are the boundaries deemed to be pretty accurate? When they do these days, with the, the advent of that LIDAR, that, that, that high resolution topography, um, they're quite accurate. I think where there's the variability, as people agreeing on, it, is the flow estimation. You know, with a real 100 year flood, please step forward, please, kind of concept. Because um, there's a lot of variability around that. But in terms of mapping a particular flood elevation, um, it, it can be done very precisely now, or it couldn't be done near as well in the past. The reason I ask is a few years back, I live, I live on the shores of the Lumano River, and I got a, a letter from FEMA stating that my house was on the flood plain, yeah. and that I had to, and I don't have a mortgage in my home, I had a home equity line of credit using it for something. And uh, they told me that my home was on a flood plan. And I had to get flood insurance. And it cost me a lot of money to have my property surveyed, filled out a ton of paperwork. I had to prove to FEMA that I was innocent. I was being guilty by them. And now I wanted to pay off the home equity line of credit at a quarter of a million bucks. I paid it off so I didn't have to buy insurance. So I, um, I, I, I really doubt that they're very accurate in their process. I, uh, it really depends 
on the age of the published data. The Lamoille has very old data. A lot of, basically, right now, eight, eight of our counties have very old data. I mean, FEMA did a study based on inferior topographic information 30 years ago. I have you pay. You'll be happy to know that they're, they're coming back to I study. I still like my money back. <laughs> I can't help you there. Um, but the FEMA is uh, starting a work this spring to restudy the Lamoille River. So you know, perhaps folks that were in your situation will have better data to rely on in this situation. But it's highly variable, the quality of the information you hit on a very important reality. We certainly won't do that on the ground. They won't need to. Thank you. Representative Dolan. Afternoon. Uh, we had heard after Top Girl's Storm, I mean, that agricultural industry in Vermont experienced $25 million, I think, at the minimum of damage associated with crop loss, disruption, property loss. Um, are we better off today? Are our farms more res resilient today? in preparation for future flooding? Um, or are we still facing um, flood risk at farms at a level that should encourage us to work with our farming community to try to improve resiliency on farms? And if that's the case, what would we do? That's a good question, and I don't know for certain exactly where we stand with our farms. Just speculating here, but I would say by and large the level of flood risk is very much the same. Again, there was an, at the time, there was not a state flood plan rule that required permits to do anything, which implements flood resilience measures. Um, uh, generally speaking, it came into effect in 2015, as I said, and I think gradually over time, just with our current authorities, in terms of our regulatory authority, there could be some gradual improvement of, as farms invest in new infrastructure and build and keep, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, but yeah, I don't think we're necessarily better off um, in any measurable way. It's not the any way that I'm aware of. Um, you know, and, and so that's a that's a it's a million dollar question. You know, what what should we do? What can we do? And the question is, do we do it through regulation? do it through some form of, you know, incentives, that, uh, grant programs, you know, most, as I understand it, I'm being an expert on ag, but a lot of these farms are having a hard time being financially solvent, so so I think they need would need a lot of assistance if they're really to boost in a significant way in a short period of time, they would need resources to, uh, to empower them to do that. Representative LaFave and then McCullough. My apologies for coming into your testimony late. And good afternoon. Uh, I, I just <clears throat> would like you to tell us uh, how would the bill we have in front of us impact your job now? Um, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, right now, as currently written, I mean, as I said, the, our rule already covers ag and forestry, which the draft proposal proposes to exempt from that 250 unless it's in a critical resource area. But it's really hard to know right now. I mean, just as written, um, there's potential for it to have a significant impact on our staff resources um, through Act 250 um, if it were to remain as is. Um, there are other opportunities, other regulatory tools that exist, <coughs> such as the flood plain, flood hazard and river corridor rule. Um, is an existing regulatory framework that could address these areas. It really depends on really what the jurisdiction, ultimately, what's the jurisdiction? I mean, if every river corridor is, uh, triggers Act 250 or regulation um, with respect to our program, I mean, it, it could be very significant. It's just hard to, it's hard to know right now without getting it more into what, what the real jurisdictional triggers are. Um, Seems to, it seems as written right now that it's a substantial increase in active 50 jurisdiction. It was raised this morning in uh, testimony that uh, the question, uh, if you had, say, uh, 50 acres and some of that acreage was uh, on a river corridor and this bill went into effect, uh, would that mean the entire 50 acres would now be under active 50 jurisdiction? 
I, I have not enough of an expert on Act 250 jurisdiction. I'm still uh, uh, surprised sometimes okay. at kind of the nuance that yeah. uh, exists with what triggers Act 250 jurisdiction. Uh, it really depends. Um, I mean, yeah. okay. that would be, that would, again, could be significant if it's uh, just a parcel being in that triggers it. Um, also, it, I think a key question is, does it bring in the full suite of Act 250 criteria for review, mm -hmm. or are we just triggering certain criteria? Because it's in a river corridor, we're going to look at it through the lens of river corridors and flood hazard areas. It's hard to know what the overarching intent is at um, this point. One last overarching question. Sure. Um, you know, are there shortcomings now in the work you do that you see this act filling? Absolutely, and I, I tried to close with that on my testimony, which is the, the clarification <laughs> of terms, standards, definitions, and statute. Um, it really, the, the language in statute that refers to floodway and floodway fringe um, is, is, is very narrow. Uses the regulatory community uh, when uh, oftentimes they'll come in with a permit application and they'll say, "Hey, we did everything right by the FEMA floodway. We're all set." We we'll say, "Oh wait, we determine the Act 250 differently. We look at the entire flood hazard area and river corridor. It's a larger area, and we have higher standards than just base uh, federal minimums." And so I think that uh, and that, that can cause a lot of inefficiency and back and forth um, working with our Office of Planning and ANR. The district commissions and consultants for the applicants that can be very iterative and drawn out and time consuming. So, I think just the modernizing of, of definitions, terms, and standards and statute to align with the way we do business now um, would be very helpful. Uh, and, and I, you know, we are the river corridor and floodplain protection program, so I think it is a very important discussion that's taking place and needs to continue regarding. Uh, what the options are that make the most sense for enhanced protection in these areas up and downstream of, of our built environment. So this would add definition into what already is happening here? Absolutely. Uh, Representative McCullough. <clears throat> so from betting you're going to get there next based on something you've said, but you've said a bunch of other things that I think you know, encourages me to ask. And, and um, the, the, the uh, common denominator is infill. And uh, we had at least one other um, state agency encouraging infill in their corridors, and one or two planners. And um, you spent a fair amount of time this morning talking about the crystal balling that needs to happen about what's going to happen in the future. <laughs> and I'm not thinking you were even talking about 50 years from now. Um, and, and so <coughs> if I'm even close to that, then um, deductive reasoning would say then why would we want to infill in our river corridors um, even if done carefully to the standards we have now, um, considering the vast great unknown? That's a fantastic question. I'll do my best to answer. Um, we talk about infilling, and we really try to accommodate infilling in densely developed areas through a num number of mechanisms. So to be clear, our procedure that dictates Act 250, our rule, our model regulations we recommend for municipality all have these provisions. So the thinking with infilling really has to do with the river corridor mm -hmm. and providing that space. And, and if you think of a place, a context or setting like Montpelier, we have a tremendous amount of investment built right up to the edge of the river. While the river might <coughs> want to wiggle over time, we're not going to let it, right? We have a huge vested collective interest in managing the river to protect our existing investments. So with respect to river corridor regulation, which is all about providing space for the river. It's really acknowledging that in our built environment, we've really lost that opportunity for the river to, to wiggle over time. Um, and in a lot of cases, the river has actually become stable. It's not, it's not a, a depositional reach where you have sediment accumulation that's transporting it downstream. Big ditches. Big ditches. 
So the idea, so on one hand, we relax with river corridors, the, 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 the standards, and so provide for infilling in these areas because we've already, we're already managing the river in these spots. But when it comes to the flood hazard area, the standards are very high. We want to build in a flood smart way. And so, you know, for example, elevation or flood proofing of buildings, the federal minimum standard is to elevate or flood proof to that quote 100 year flood elevation. Our standards and rule and Act 250 procedure require two feet above that. So that's we're, what we're trying to do is think about, okay, well, here's the regulatory design elevation that the feds want, but we realize there's a changing climate. Tomorrow's 100-year flood might be larger than yesterday's 100-year flood. Back to your question about how the stuff is estimated, the flood flows are based on historical information, not looking at future conditions, hydrology, and runoff. So, so you know, and I think with the, the other... So I think we can, in places like Montpelier, Waterbury Village, Wilmington, um, we can infill and redevelop in a way that is flood resilient and in consideration of climate change. There's no guarantee. When you're in the river bottom, there's always risk. We're just trying to buy down that risk um, mm -hmm. by having higher standards. So I think I understand with your further explanation really is, is have areas that are already armored to the hill. We're not going to kill Waterbury. They got to move. We're going to protect downtown Waterbury, downtown Montpelier as best we can. And infill in those areas would be appropriate. Um, I'm a little hazy on how appropriate it gets when you're um, up on on the North Branch, for instance. Or, uh, farther on the main river, we'll just talk about Winooski, when, when even though, according to our best guess, our best guesses, uh, that maybe two extra people be, be enough. I would say, why would we go there? And you, I think you've probably done your best to answer that, but yeah, no, I can. can I just, well, before I, sure. are you, Mike, are you planning to testify? Okay, so we have, uh, we're, we, we started a little bit late, so I want to just let the next, um, we're, we're meeting with our legislative council after this. So I would say 320, because that, we started about 20 minutes. We can take this back to the hall. <coughs> no, I mean, we, we were going to give the, these guys an hour, so that's what you planned on, and we'll give it to you. I'll just quickly address your question and then hand it over to Mike. Does that sound good? Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, again, the infilling is thinking of those built out areas. When we're looking upstream where we have an, an undeveloped reach of river, you know, the river corridor is essentially a no build, no fill zone. The idea is if you're outside of the river corridor in the flood hazard area, we've given the river that room, its space, we're, we're giving it that space to minimize erosion hazards. Um, if you're outside the river corridor, then that's where you'd be developing, you know, to higher standards in terms of inundation, elevation, flood proofing, etc. You know, we try to structure our, our regulatory frameworks and authorities such that um, we're really protecting those areas up and downstream for flood water storage and sediment attenuation. That's our macro scale green infrastructure that can protect places like Montpelier and Waterbury if we if we uh, maintain or enhance those. I think there. I have a quick question though. How sure. many permits do you does your program issue in a year, and, and how many get denied? I want to. Say, we don't issue a whole lot of permits because again, a lot, by and large, land uses are still regulated at the municipal level, so it's just that subset of things that towns can't regulate. I'd say over the last four years, we've issued about 100 permits, but we've given a tremendous amount of technical assistance, well over and above that. A lot of times, it's trying to work with folks to site stuff outside of these areas, so they don't need a permit. So we spend a lot of time on it, but we, our permit numbers don't necessarily reflect that. Can you keep track of how often, you, you know, how many people you help in here? Yes, we have, uh, we track general technical assistance. Uh, so we have, we have those numbers and uh, that and permit numbers as well. So. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sure. What do you mean permits? What permits are they? State flood, oh yeah, that's good. I'm glad you asked. I'm talking about not Act 250 permits. We don't issue those, we just advise the commissions. This is our state flood hazard area and river corridor permits. And those permits get uh, backstopped against those things that the towns can't regulate. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
afternoon. <clears throat> well, again, my name is uh, Mike Klein. State Rivers Program, Agency of Natural Resources. And I, I uh, wanted to touch on another set of activities that we work with the agricultural community on, and that is the in-stream activities. Rob was talking about uh, you know, activities on the land, and uh, our program uh, through our stream alteration rule and our partnerships with the Agency of Ag and NRCS, uh, we also look at regulate to some extent uh, agricultural activities in stream. One of the, um, so I was just going to go down through uh, a short list of what some of those activities are and describe uh, how, we, how we do or don't regulate those activities. Um, we, in Act, 1, Act 138, uh, Act, uh, which was in 2012, uh, gave the agency authority over the construction of berms. Farms are regulated uh, and largely prohibited activity unless there's a public safety issue. Water is impinging on your habitable structure, you would be permitted to burn. Otherwise, uh, they, are, they wouldn't be permitted. Uh, many agricultural uh, producers uh, do uh, take a certain amount of gravel out of our rivers on an annual basis. Our Chapter 41 stream alteration rule allows upwards to uh, 50 cubic yards per year uh, uh, on a landowner's land for use on their land. Uh, they, they, they just need to contact us and provide technical assistance uh, on how to do that in a way that minimizes impact to the river. Um, basically, uh, staying out of the water uh, to do that work. Stream bank stabilization, um, as you may have heard this morning, that is one of the required agricultural practices. So we do not actually issue permits for stream bank stabilization on farms. Uh, the RIPs require that um, bank stabilization be conducted uh, in, a, in accordance with, a, with a, uh, a plan by either NRCS or the Agency of Agriculture consistent with our policy for avoiding uh, erosion hazards. Uh, we do work with the Agency of Agriculture and, on our, and on NRCS uh, <coughs> Advising stream bank stabilization on farms. However, we don't write a permit. Um, one of the, one of the uh, I think governing factors to that uh, activity is the cost. Uh, bank armoring is an expensive um, proposition these days, and in many cases where farmers have been uh, you know, struggling with the entry streams and the expense of dealing with that. We work with the Agency of Agriculture and NRCS and other partners to offer alternative tools like our river quarter easement. Uh, many farmers, over 100 uh, landowners, have taken advantage of that program uh, to, uh, to sell an easement to that river quarter land in, in, instead of uh, channelization practices. Uh, we also um, you know, allow for fording of our streams Again, with proper erosion control practices in place, uh, our, our, both our rule and our general permit contemplate that uh, on, you know, our rule covers perennial streams. And at a certain threshold of perennial stream, in our rule it's looked at at about a half a square mile drainage. Um, many of these small, small perennial streams become intermittent. <coughs> And we define that as the threshold at which a farmer could maintain their ditches in their field as long as, again, as certain uh, erosion control and best practices are used in maintaining those ditches. And again, we, you know, we advise uh, a number of farmers and work with our partners at NRCS to review those projects. You know, streams larger than that would have to conform with our other performance standards. Uh, and then finally, um, bridges and culverts uh, on, on farms do uh, fall under our jurisdiction and do have to meet uh, our state uh, standards for bridge and culvert replacement. And so that's really a rundown of the typical ways that we interact with the uh, farming community uh, you know, on these streets. So I'd like to answer any questions there or other questions that you Chance to ask Rob. Where 
Well, how's that non-reporting general permit work? A non-reporting general permit essentially lays out a set of conditions. If you practice those, if you uh, are implementing a practice and you follow those conditions, you don't need to report to the agency that you're doing that activity. <coughs> If, if you uh, if, 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 uh, if it's found that you implemented that activity and did not follow uh, those practices laid out in the general permit, that it would be uh, enforceable. So how does that landowner know about what standards they need to maintain if they're not necessarily in working with you directly in the, before the project commences? Well, it, you know, it's it's like any other uh, activity out there. A landowner that um, has never worked with the environmental agency may start an activity without knowing that they needed a permit. Certainly, uh, we we have worked with many of the agricultural producers uh, and road and town road foremen. Uh, know our river management engineers um, and um, are well aware of. The activities they need a permit for. Uh, I think the, uh, we work in partnership again with the agency of AI and, and NRCS, uh, their field reps, inform landowners as to what types of activities would be required. But there are unfortunate situations where people start in on a stream and without knowing that they need to work with us and, uh, you know, and, and we have to you know, come back and, and get a square away. So in your opinion, like, there's always, you know, the <coughs> lack of information might result in someone not knowing, but uh, do you find it a successful tool, all in all, you know, generally speaking? The general permit? The non-reporting general permit in terms of achieving, <coughs> uh, what, what are the, you know, so what are the benefits that the, outweigh well, the costs? The, the, yeah, the benefits uh, are, Representative Dolan, that we, um, you know, we, we, we look at, Probably a thousand stream alterations a year. Um, you know, uh, each engineer might look at uh, two or three hundred projects in the field season, and so we try to identify those activities that are fairly have a set of practices that are fairly easy to to uh, implement, and <coughs> the criteria in Chapter 41, which is public safety, significant damage to fish and wildlife, and significant damage to other riparian working in some of these small, very, very small streams on activities that are relatively routine uh, would stand much less of a chance of, of uh, pushing us into those sort of red zones of significant damage. Um, so it's, it's the, it's the uh, potential threat to resource and the use of our resource, the program resources to maximize our effectiveness on the ground of spending time where the where the impacts are likely to be much greater if we don't do it correctly. Nice. Uh, back to uh, gravel removal. Yes. It says here that you can remove up to 50 cubic yards per year if it's Yeah, I have to give 72 hours notice if I take 10 cubic yards or more. If I decide to take 9 cubic yards, I don't need to tell you. That's right. Now, if I come back 30 days later, can I take a 9, a nine cubic yards without letting you know? I, I, think it, I think it's stated, uh, I may have to go and check back on this, but I think it's stated that it's per year, a 50 cubic yard threshold per I year. I understand that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, it's a good question. I don't know that I've ever, I've ever, uh, ever dealt with that. Usually, landowners don't like to mobilize equipment, you know, twice to get a job done. And we have a pretty good work. It's, it's not really an activity that we prohibit. Uh, so, uh, you know, most landowners, they need 30 cubic yards. They work with us uh, to identify a good location and. But we, we haven't spelled out, to be, to be honest, we haven't spelled out directly in our general permit that, that you, you can't do what you just described. I don't think that, that exact wording is in there. Well, I would think 
tent, right? Now, what, what if you had uh, a two-mile stretch of river and you had ten farms on it, and they each decided they wanted to take out 50 cubic yards of gravel per year? That's a significant, That's a significant amount. amount. And now, how do you monitor that, and what do you do about that kind of activity? Well, by law, I'm not sure I could prohibit that because it is an individual landowner. Uh, it's by individual uh, landowner. So if you have 10 different farm families back to back, they can each take the 50 cubic yards um, as long as they stay out of the water, et cetera. I mean, it, it, it is an imperfect uh, uh, piece of law. It's, it's actually right in Chapter 41 in the sense that uh, even 10 cubic yards on a very small tree could have a deleterious effect. And so it's not scaled to the resource very well. Um, or, or really thought through from a cumulative uh, impact standpoint. When you say stay out of the water, what, what is that? What is that? I mean, it means at the time of you're taking the gravel, you keep your machine out of the river itself. So usually you're working on gravel bars, okay. and you're just you're just basically not digging in the river itself at the time that you're, you're getting the resources. So, so you know, yeah, you wouldn't go out there during higher water and and, and, and take your animal. So if it were an excavator, it can actually go into the water as long as it's taking material from a bar or a dry spot. Or do you keep the machinery out of the water entirely? We would try to keep the machine out of the water and create access. And you don't allow any excavation on the banks. No. Just <clears throat> Any more questions for Mike? Do you have comments or thoughts on the Act 250 revisions or the like how it might play out in, from your perspective if we designated the river corridors as critical resources? Um, uh, not, not a whole lot over and above what you've heard from the agency already, except to say that, as Rob was saying, you know, our primary concern is being able to do uh, the job that we do in Act 250. Uh, and it is, it is uh, a lot of direct staff time projects. Uh, Act 250 is, is uh, from the strict perspective of, of hazard uh, avoidance is, is, is uh, much less efficient than our actual regulatory permit program, where that's what we're dealing with, is looking at those hazards and trying to uh, mitigate them. So from my perspective, uh, from the program's perspective, you know, we, we have been charged with protecting river corridors. We've been charged with promoting their protection uh, and, you know, throughout the state with our municipal partners. So we're very much interested in, in uh, you know, seeing the river core protection advanced in a way that is commensurate with our ability to, uh, to, to support that regulatory work. And do you have the ability, to, currently, are, do you have the ability to do what you're doing, or are you, are people maxed out, or what is the situation? Um, you know, again, Rob mentioned, um, you know, our permit program. I, I think I testified in front of the committee uh, a couple weeks ago on our river board report that we provide about 1,000 municipal assistance um, on flood hazards per year. Um, that keeps our, our floodplain managers pretty busy. Um, if if, if we were doing the direct regulatory work ourselves, there would be efficiency in that process. And, but right now, the way we operate is mainly an assistance role. Uh, we're, we're pretty maxed out. Just a point of clarification. Uh, so you, your shop provides municipalities assistance in compliance with the National Flood Insurance Program, and that's about a thousand um, technical assistance, technical assistance yeah. uh, a year. But you also said you you provide another thousand visits per year related to stream alteration um, right. permits, but and then you review <coughs> some two hundred projects. Well, you had mentioned of that, I think about two hundred project reviews. Well, we, we might, we might, we might, 
I don't have those numbers right in front of me, but the issue about 850 permits a year, we will um, review close to 20 or over 2,000 projects per year on the streamlined side. And, and I think it is you know, fairly similar on the river corridor and floodplain side. I, again, I, I could get you those exact numbers. <coughs> so we, we keep track of all that. Is it in your submission on Jan from January 15th? No, this would be our full results based accountability. You know, yeah. And we have that broken down in quite a bit of detail on exactly what we do, where, and my, how. My line of questioning is, is trying to get at how much of your workload is related to Act 250 versus your standard work. And well, what you just described as your standard the standard work, work, right? And I don't know whether Rob has an idea of how many Act 250 um, uh, projects that we review on an annual basis. Uh, for the record, Rob Evans, um, yeah, it's a it's a hard number to pin down because it's not really. Our, we put a lot of effort into Act 250. I'd say our regional floodplain managers. We have five that support the three regulatory jurisdictions: local permitting, Act 250, and the state floodplain rule. Um, with respect to Act 250, you know, it can be variable from year to year depending on the individual, but they could spend easily half their time on Act 250. The amount of projects may not be high, but because of a large scale project coupled with the inefficiency um, of, the, of the process, I'll, I'll use an example, the hotel that's proposed right here in downtown Montpelier, I've got a floodplain manager and my time uh, has been spent significantly over the last 12 months, and we're still not done. Mm -hmm. So we, we put a lot of time and effort into it, but the, the numbers of permits that Act 250 issues isn't really reflective of that effort because it's such a drawn out process from a time standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Committee, we have uh, Michael O'Grady up next. Um, we told him to come back to 320, which is just about now. Um, the hope is that we will um, review the changes to H63, which we're hopefully moving in on. Which one do you want to work on first? H63. So you might want to pull it up and see what those changes are. Laura, I'm wondering if. Um, Changing the wording or the lettering on our door is on somebody's radar to make it. It is. I've asked them about it a couple of times. Okay. <laughs> Somebody. Nice. <laughs> they did that. They Insert the line here. They yeah. Um, Grab on a line. <laughs> All right. They were we are ready to get started here. Welcome. Hello. I'm hoping to look at each. Three. Maybe on. So I have some paper copies. Who would like one? That's not a bad idea. Whatever happened to the red ship? Do you need more? No. no. <clears throat> Should I walk through it? Yes, please. Well, the first thing I want to walk through is a change I didn't make. Uh, page one on line eight and nine in the title, section 1530, I forgot to strike deposit transaction account leverage redemption fund. That should be removed. Do you really want to keep that fund? Is there like a... <laughs> there is no fund. I know. I Huh. Um, on page one, line 13, uh, what is being struck is the requirement that the deposit initiator opens a separate interest bearing account. When you strike that requirement, you can strike subsection C, which is the requirement for the deposit initiator to initiate putting the um, deposits collected into that account. There's no account, there's no need to direct them to put it into the account. And that leads you to page two, line five. That now becomes subsection C. And 
so the requirements for the deposit initiator to remit to report and then remit the unclaimed deposits remains uh, it goes into effect january 1st 2020. any reference to the deposit initiator account is struck so on page two line seven and eight they are not reporting regarding the transaction account on page two <coughs> lines 11 and 12 the report does no longer include the balance of the transaction account there is no longer a report of the refund of payments from that account on line 17 and 18 and there's similarly no report about the income earned on the account there is no account and then on page three lines one and two there's no report on any other activity on the account so what is being reported this is the deposit initiator reports the number of containers sold in the preceding quarter and the number of containers returned the amount of deposits received the, uh, that there's a reference to the deposit transaction account as we struck the amount of refund payments made and that's it um, on page three lines nine through 13 the formula for calculation of the amount of the abandoned beverage container deposits is struck and instead there's the narrative the deposit initiator what the amount of the abandoned beverage container is the amount equal to the, the amount of deposits that the deposit initiator collected in the quarter less the amount of the total refund value paid out by the deposit initiator and on page three lines 19 and 20 um, the deposit initiator can apply to the commissioner of taxes if they have um, what the refunded exceeds the amount of deposits collected in the court and then the commissioner can authorize that on page four uh, under those criteria, the change there being if the commissioner determines that the deposits collected by the initiator are insufficient. And on page four, line 16, you wanted that confidential business information, uh, the information <coughs> reported by the deposit initiator is confidential business information exempt from public inspection. And that's it. Any questions? Representative Odie? So now we're not doing the monthly collection, we're doing it quarterly, but somehow, what about interest on the deposits? Are there any interest that we're going to be able You're never keeping interest under the existing law that the deposit initiator was allowed to keep the interest. Well, I thought when we With the new, with the language from one of the monthly, was it? Yeah. Well, what's this thing? It's, so, under the existing law, what you are amending, the account, the separate account, would bear interest. And in order to calculate the amount, effectively to do an audit, of the account each month the deposit initiator would need to report what they collected what they refunded and the amount of interest on it and that would allow the department of taxes or a and r to determine what was actually unclaimed and what should be remitted sorry to the state line you don't have that separate account requirement if you're doing it based on point of sale software that retailers maintain there is no interest there is no i don't know if they'll have an account i don't know if they'll put it into an account they'll just be liable for the payment um, <coughs> order. so couldn't you compute interest on what the amounts are when you look back well, one of the things you, you want to think about is um, 
is that of the sheet. The whole concept of the sheet is when you're returning to the state is property abandoned. Is interest on those unclaimed deposits over a quarter abandoned? Or is it going to be argued to be a taking? Um, the best argument for either. <laughs> uh, well, since you are not separating this money out and the uh, deposit initiator can be commingling these monies with other monies and thereby raising interest on all of their monies, requiring remittance of interest be difficult to distinguish from interest on funds that are not to be remitted and so there's an argument that whatever you would be requiring to be remitted as interest would be a taking. The argument that it's not a taking is that um, it's on property that is abandoned and the <coughs> The state should have a right to grow interest on property that was abandoned, but it hasn't been abandoned for more than three months. Well, I have another thing then. We, I mean, we reacted to a tiny a brewery who came and said something, it's only a few nickels, and don't make me have my separate cap for it. But there are levels of things, right? So there are people who have very, very a common benefits issue. Um, what's that? Um, common benefits clause yeah. is similar to the equal protection clause under the U.S. Constitution, except it's common benefits and common burden. And so <clears throat> you need to have a legitimate state interest for distinguishing between two classes in allocating a burden is different with regard to a burden. And I'm doing it. I mean, legitimate state interest is not really a huge bar to jump over. We need to have one. It's, 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 it's not. In this case. I, I, you know, I'm not sure what you're, I'm not the one that asserts the legitimate state interest. You have to assert the legitimate state interest. Representative Terry. Yeah, Michael, I just want to ask, um, this bill here, will it further uh, hurt the uh, bottling and beverage industry? I don't know how to answer that. Will it decrease their profits? I, I can't say. Will it cost, will they be losing a, a potential revenue stream that they use to run the beverage container deposit system? Yes. Thank um, Madam Chairman, are we voting today? I thought we were. Good. I'm hoping to. Uh, Representative Dolan. Um, <coughs> I think we have a couple of options then. One is to either have a monthly <coughs> deposit and to be um, a monthly process versus quarterly or a quarterly process. Do you have a preference in terms of what you think would be the most ease of use? Um, because I, I guess a monthly would reduce the, the um, concern that representability raised in terms of um, interest. Um. I don't think it uh, either way it obviates the difficulty. The difficulty is going to be able to be able to figure out what the interest, what interest should be returned. No, I was just thinking of just having a remittance on a monthly basis. Does that obviate the concern? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. 
right. being concerned about I mean, accumulated interest? <coughs> that reduces the amount of interest, um, especially over that nickel that's collected on the first day of each quarter. But since you don't have a separate account, how do you audit the interest that is generated? Right? Well, I'm less interested about that. I'm more thinking about it in terms of getting the money into the state, the state with the managing it as a funding source. And well, that's, I mean, there's, there's two different aspects of that. There's the administrative burden of collection. And I don't know if the Department of Taxes is here, but they would probably like to do that four times a year instead of 12 times a year. So the cost, if you look at both costs and benefits, it's probably a more efficient <coughs> system and minimize costs regardless of the interest issue if, if you manage it on a quarterly basis. The second aspect of that is having the money in the fund to move the money. But you can spend money in anticipation of receipts. And after the first year, you'll have a pretty good idea of what your, your anticipated receipts are going to be. A representative four gates and then McCullough. Uh, <clears throat> because this question of interest came up at our last discussion, I worked on it a little bit last night. And I made some assumptions. And the assumption, you know, you asked me to do that in the drink. The assumption first assumption I made was we were talking about $1.4 million at the end of the year as an estimate of what was going to be turned over to the state. Uh, so I said $1.5 million. And dividing $1.5 million by 12 to get what would be, could be an average monthly would be $125,000. The interest that would be earned on $125,000 would be $104 for every 1% of interest that was earned. Wait, you were not going to earn that. I, 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 and, and I've got no way of knowing what the state earns for interest. Uh, and I assume, <clears throat> I assume they have sweep account and they sweep everything into interest bearing. Uh, so I said, well, what would be maybe an, <coughs> an average interest rate? And I used 3%. I don't know really what, what they would get. They'd probably get more than that, uh, I would think, with the amount of dollars they would have invested. But using 3%, uh, it would then be $312.50 a month on $125,000. So if you assume that each of those three months and a quarter you're going to be adding 125,000, and um, so at the end of three months, the earnings on $375,000 at 3% would be $1,875. So that's whether you consider that a lot of money or not a lot of money, to me, $1,875 would be quite a bit of money to the state when you're talking millions of dollars. It's not that big. Um, and interesting that on $1,500,000 at five cents a bottle, that's 30 million containers at the end of the year that don't get turned in. And that's what we're talking about on this SG. Um, and I think I think that interest calculation is high. Well, I, I, I try to be on the safe side. Right. Because you're talking about the interest being remitted from the deposit initiator. They may not get three percent. Well, no, I no, I was talking of if it was turned over to the state, how much the state would be losing by not having it turned over every the way this thing was originally set up. And I'm not, I'm not doing that to say, I'm not do, doing that to justify doing it that way. I'm doing it that way just to have a figure to talk about. 
period. That's my that's my little speech on that. <laughs> Representative McCullough. So I bear a significant amount of culpability for getting this interest discussion going maybe two weeks ago, where I thought um, council had really answered all the questions about whose interest, whose money it was, and what might even be vaguely possible to do with it. Having said that, um, there have been some interesting comments and and even the study <laughs> report, and, and it's all very interesting. But, and let, uh, so, but let the record show that I'm standing here for the beverages industry, saying this costs them money to do. And for us to somehow, and I would say convolutedly, reach into their pocketbook to get some interest out of this would be unjust. And having having said that, um, and and we've gone through a pretty good discussion around this bill as presented by uh, today by Michael with the changes. Um, I feel confident in uh, moving the bill with the Scribner changes that, that Michael discovered. All right, a motion has been made. Um, to approve the draft. Representative Forgates. I just need to make a further comment, but if you, you want to see if you get a second or... We don't need a second. Okay. Um, now, now I forgot what it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, no, what I was going to say is the, the, the interest is the interest that the distributors might or might not be getting is a small amount when we've already taken 1.4 million dollars out of their pocket because they have up to this point have been able to keep this money themselves until we until we passed the law last year so there we would be further taking out of their pocket any possible interest that might be there. And you, take, you have to take into consideration the other thing that the distributor has to do is pay the retailer three and a half cents. In addition to the five cents, three and a half cents for handling, for the handling of that every bottle or can. Right. Representative Dolan, do you have another comment? Any other, any further discussion? Um, we need the Scribner's error corrected, I guess. Can you want to go to still keep the same draft? Pardon me? You can keep the same draft on Sure. Yes, please. So you're going to vote 2.1 then? Yeah. All right. All right. Clerk shall commence to call the roll. Representative Pates? Yes. Representative Dolan? Yes. Representative Forget? Yes. Representative Fave? Yes. Representative Bullock? Aye. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> I didn't understand. Uh, Representative Morgan? No. Representative Bodie? Yeah. Representative Smith? Yes. Representative Squirrel? Yes. Representative Tarantini? No. Yes. Um, we had a, a motion, but I, I don't know if we're really out of order here. We didn't have a second. I think we need a second. We don't need a second. We don't need a second. We've done that in the past. <coughs> yeah, that's all but that's fine. We don't need a second. Okay. Now we need um, someone who's interested in reporting the bill on the floor. I will if all else fails, but I don't want to take I don't want to take that privilege away from anyone. That really wants to. <laughs> <laughs> we have a volunteer. <laughs> Thank you very much, Representative Forgate. Really? Thank you. <laughs> we were sacrificed. <laughs> Who 
What's the vote? What's the vote? All right. Nine in favor, two against. And when Michael comes back, we're going to take up uh, water quality funding, George Taylor's bill. If George is ready, I mean, are you, did he say he could come in? Uh, yes, he did. That'd be great to get him. Okay. Do you want to take a little break? Um, all right. I, oh, I think, are we on the record, Jim? Yes. Great. Thank you. Just double checking. check. This. Um, and yeah. under witnesses, we can find. We can find. For a bill. This is what's the number one? 171. 171. <laughs> Um, but you are up under George Hill also. So if committee members are looking for George's bill, it's under his name for H-171. Or Laura's got copies. <laughs> Thank you. We're just looking for the high level of kind of why you introduced it and what your goals are. Thank you for the record. Representative George Hill from Jericho. And the chair, members of the committee, thanks for um, here we from H-171. So H-171 is aimed at uh, long-term uh, long um, funding for clean water. Um, and the idea in the bill is to, one, follow the concept that all everybody's in, and number two, to find things with, which had a nexus with our water problems. Um, so this bill um, includes work, um, information about five types of um, revenue sources. Um, and um, we also, of course, have the sheets, which are the bottles, the non-return bottles, which raises two million dollars but we don't mention that in this bill. Do you know so, the interest on that two million no, <laughs> we, just voted, we just voted some changes to that we had a long discussion about interest. <laughs> so sorry. Um nobody can find out. No we're, we're all set no, there. Please. <laughs> we don't um, want to bring it up anymore. <laughs> so um the thing that, that you guys you all talk about up here the most of anybody in the building is probably the, the, what contributes to the to the, the water issues that we have. And, you know, obviously the reading I've done, uh, impervious services has a, a big contribution. You know, when you, we talked a year or two ago about the, the treasurer's report, you know, there's debate about a parcel fee versus a, an impervious service fee. And you know, some of the parcels are with them, which actually reduce our, our pollution issues, not increase them. And it seems dramatically unfair to, to charge uh, parcel fee to those folks. Um, so, you know, I settled on an impervious service fee because of the clear nexus. Um, and, and the way we did the impervious service fee is in the four buckets, depending on how much um, impervious service you got in here. Property. <clears throat> the um, you know the UVM has has mapped the impervious services of the, the state down to half a meter. Um, it's, it's really pretty amazing work to, to see how they mapped it. All those maps are um, are completed, undergoing a, a final look over, and uh, they should be available. Week or so. Um, it, so, you know, what needs to happen is you need to open the parcels on that. And there's a little bit of consternation about how accurate our, our parceling is at the uh, uh, local levels and the municipal level. But, so what we do is throw it into four buckets. How many square feet of impervious surface do you have? So, we're about to have a walkthrough with. Council yeah, so, so we, we throw that in, it's just graduate. The more impervious surface you have, the higher the, you know, the, higher the, the fee. And you know, that raises about $11 million 
dollars the way I think it's set up right now. Um, we also, I also believe that tourists they benefit from clean waters and they contribute to the pollution, and so we put an occupancy fee on hotels, motels, Airbnb, bed and breakfasts of a dollar a night. Um, I don't believe that a dollar a night dissuades anybody from coming to the um, and that raises about three point four million. When we look at the impervious surfaces, 37% um, of the impervious surfaces are, are roads. And we're not going to, um, we're not going to put an impervious surface fee on the municipalities, on the state itself. Um, we can't put it on railroads or federal government and stuff. But with 37% of the uh, impervious surface actually being roads, um, you know, it, for a way to get some, to assign some of the, the, the financial burden there. And for that, it's a, I put in a um, tax on asphalt. So when asphalt is sold by the ton, regardless of who it's sold to in the state, whether that's a municipality, the state, or a private person doing their driveway or parking lot, um, it's a, I put a dollar <coughs> ton fee on that. The numbers I look at, it's like, uh, you know, kind of asphalt generally costs around 70 or so. so this adds a dollar to that and, and raises, oh, can't be absolutely sure, but around a million dollars a year. Um, the um, farm communities, obviously the farms um, caught an issue. Uh, we, we looked at, I looked at the uh, fertilizer fee first, and the fertilizer fee um, turns out to not to be very helpful if because to raise you know, a small amount of money to, in, the, in the millions range, we'd have to bump that fertilizer fee up to seventy-five dollars. Um, you know, I can't remember what it is now. It's something way less. I mean, um, and so um, what I said along was milk handlers. You know, we know the farmers are, are struggling. With I believe the milk handlers are still making some money, um, and we um, put a we we produce about 2.6 billion pounds of milk a year in Vermont. About 1.6 billion stays in state. The other is go to the out of state for processing. So this applies to the 1.6 billion pounds that stays in state. And the processing fee or the, the fee on the processors is. Uh, 0.1 cent, so 0 0.001 cent, and that raises about 1.6 million dollars. Um, and the last thing is the property transfer tax, where we have a surcharge already, um, and what we do with that is just repeal the sunset of the property uh, transfers. Tax surcharge. We just repealed the sunset of that, and that the, the uh, property transfer tax looks like it's going to raise about five million dollars a year. So, with the sheets altogether, that's twenty-four million three hundred thousand um, dollars a year for the and I, for the uh, clean clean water initiative. It almost all goes into the clean water fund. Michael can tell you about why the milk processor has to go into the general fund first. But, um, it does. It's good. And, um, you know, it, it, the idea that 94% of the waters of Vermont being compromised to some extent, that really everybody needs to do something. Nobody should be a, have to do it all. Um, and so this tries to spread it around with sustainable, <coughs> long term sources, which we've got to come up with by July. Thanks. Any questions for Representative Till before we do a walkthrough? Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank you very much.
Um, would you like me to begin? Uh, so H-171 is an act related to water quality funding. Uh, this is my great legislative council, section one of the bill on page two, uh, as a chapter to title 32, which is the taxation chapter. And it would uh, establish an impervious surface fee First, let's look at the definition of what is an impervious surface, page 2, lines 9 through 11. Man-made surfaces, including paved and unpaved roads, parking areas, roofs, driveways, and walkways, for which precipitation run, runs off rather than infiltrates. The thing that people don't intuitively understand when they think about impervious surfaces is that it includes unpaved roads. It includes a gravel road. Just because it doesn't have asphalt on it doesn't mean that it's not impervious. Then there's the definition of parcel. The fee is going to be assessed on parcels. This is the definition for parcel that is used in the grand list, so the municipal tax uh, lingo is the same, except there's one key difference. So it's all contiguous land and the same ownership together with all improvements that are in. And the key difference is it shall include a parcel exempt from taxation under section 3802 of this title, unless specifically exempt. So that means that the parcels that are exempt from the property tax are subject to this impervious surface assessment. So you know, churches, universities, charitable organizations, etc. And that's on the basis of the all-in principle. Page 2, line 16. The impervious surface key is, is going to hinge on the key off of the impervious surface maps that are developed um, by or for the Vermont Center for Geographic Information Services. So on or before January 1, 2020, uh, BCGIS provides to the department, and that's the Department of Taxes, and each municipality a map of the percentage of impervious surface on each parcel within the municipality. And you will see that on page three, BCGIS is required to update that map upon notification from a municipality of newly constructed or expanded impervious surface and the need for a correction to a map due to an error of municipal review of the parcel. Should I move down? Michael, you have another copy. Then on page three, line eight, this is the establishment of the assessment, the liability for it, and how it is collected. So page three, line nine, beginning July 2020, each municipality in the state shall assess an appropriate surface fee on every parcel of the municipality. <coughs> so the key thing there is the municipality is assessing. So the municipality is the one that assesses and collects under this model. There are exemptions. The following parcels are exempt. That's referenced by Representative Till. The federal government, those under control by the state, those under control by municipality, and a parcel within the limits of a railroad track right away. Uh, part of the basis of that, those exemptions is, especially on, on the state, you're just moving money from one hand to the other. Um, it really shouldn't need to do that. Going to allocate resources to allocate resources. Uh, page three, line 20, then you get to the amount of an impervious surface fee. Again, the municipality collects from the owner of a parcel an impervious surface fee in the following amounts. And this is based on the bin system that I'm not sure if Jarla talked to you about the bins. We haven't heard from them yet. Okay. So the concept is that the impervious surface maps that, that are overlaid on parcels are pretty accurate, but not fail safe. And so instead of basing the fee on square footage or acreage, which has some 
some error because, as you'll hear probably from the rel relevant witnesses, there's things can throw off the square footage, like shading from a tree. They, that can either mimic pervious surface or mask the pervious surface. But generally, you will have a good calculation of the percentage. So <clears throat> what was proposed is that instead of doing it based on your square footage, you do it on bins or categories that, that people are put in these different bins and assess the fee based on the bin that they're in. So on page four, you'll see that the fee is $10 per parcel per year if you're on a parcel with less than 2,000 square feet. It's $20 a year per parcel if you're between um, your 2,000 or more, but less than 4,000, it's 30 per year. If you're 4,000 or more, but less than 10,000, and then it's $100 per year for a parcel with more than 10,000 square feet of impervious surface. Then on page four, line nine, you get to collection. It's collection, they collected by the municipality as part of the tax bill. It says under subsection 5402B. That, that is the property tax bill. And specifically the education property tax bill. It is directed to be listed separately from the tax collected. On page four, line 14, the treasurer of each municipality shall remit the impervious surface in two payments, one due on December 1st and the other on June 1st. The owner of the parcel may seek abatement from a municipality under the normal abatement authority. You're sick. You died. You no longer own the property. You moved out of state. Um, those are the, the general abatement authorities. Page four, you'll see that there's administration provisions unless otherwise provided. The commissioner of taxes shall administer and enforce the collection of the impervious surface fee in the same manner as it administers and enforces the collection of the tax under chapter 133. That's its collection of the property tax. The commissioner may, under its enforcement authority, offset any delinquent impervious surface assessment against a refund. So if you're not paying your fee, but you're getting a state income tax refund, they can take that out of your refund. <laughs> um, and then on page five, line seven, the commissioner of taxes deposits all impervious surface fees into the clean water fund for the purposes of that fund. Do, do um, members have questions on this section, Representative Odie? Well, this is being collected by the municipalities on the existing tax bill. Mm -hmm. So the concept is that there will be some cost initially to re retrofit those bills, but going into the future, the cost should be relatively lower than what it would cost the state to do it, because this, this is already in place. So almost, once you reprint the way it looks on the bill, there's no extra cost unless you are dealing with well, it's a cost of municipality somebody um, somebody um, asked for the payment, but otherwise there's two other costs um, one is that under the education property tax system municipalities are obligated to cover the the cost due from them each payment period so if somebody doesn't pay, the municipality has to cover that cost. In the past, there's been language that said for this assessment, municipalities don't need to cover the cost of the unpaid fee. That, that language is not in here. So what's in here is that they collect according to their authority for education property tax. That means that they have to cover the cost of the unpaid fee. Municipalities don't like that. It is a cost to them. 
because if they want to go and recoup that cost, they have to they have to initiate enforcement of their own to recoup that cost. So that is a cost to them. The second cost to them was this is going to cover all parcels that are currently exempt and under that all in principle. They currently don't send the bill to those parcels. They're going to have to determine what parcels are there that are exempt, and then they're going to have to bill those parcels the relevant amount depending on which bid they fall on. So that's an additional cost. And, and George gave us estimated revenue for each of these to reflect the costs. Do you have any idea how deep those? Uh, I don't know if Dan has done that analysis for him yet. I know he was producing the revenue generated. I don't know if he was doing cost. And are the, the four buckets created linked to anything else? I haven't calculated this in acreages of the square feet, but are they calculated to other things, other ways we talk about in Herbie services currently, like half acre, one acre, three acre? They're just, how are they picked? Four buckets. Uh, they were picked looking at some of the data on the amount of parcels in the, the different categories. So trying kind of looking at size, like how many are in that first bin, how many are in the second bin, how many in the third bin. Trying to find some, not total equality, but trying to find some um, kind of equal numbers. <coughs> And it's not, it's not equal because the, the number of bins, number of parcels in that last bin is, is small compared to the first bin. Any other questions on this representative code? To, to clarify about that fourth bin, the number of people fall into the fourth bin may be small, <coughs> but the square footage that they're representing of 10,000 square feet or greater I would say could be quite significant. Is that, is that fair? It's, it's true. I mean, if you have really long driveways or really long unpaved roads on your property, <coughs> then you may be. Right. Or a certain very large manufacturing facility in a junction, um, <laughs> for instance. So, yeah, right. I, to, to an extent, any kind of bin system or flat fee um, without a modifier is going to be regressive. Um, and so figuring out how to address that and eliminate the regressive nature of some of these, it, it's difficult. It, it, well, it's not difficult. It can be done. It's, it's, it looks difficult. And like the equivalent residential unit formula, where you figure out what the, what the, what the normal residential unit, half acre, what they're responsible for, how much impervious surface is on their land, and you assess them a basic fee, and then you use that fee as the modifier for the square footage on commercial or industrial or large residential property. That's how you kind of eliminate that regressive nature, um, because it's you go back to a common common factor, the ERU, but then it's based off of your actual square footage or size or acreage or whatever you want to make that parcel and parcel type, um, and so that's that sounds difficult and it really looks convoluted when you put it in a narrative on a page. But when you write it out as a math formula, it's not that. It's pretty right. We'll have to we'll struggle with that one probably. Okay. Representative Dolan. Uh, just on, um, let's see, page three, lines four and five. Um, was there any consideration to just quarterly update or annually update or every five years update? So I imagine if they trickle in across the state, that's where you might want to batch. And, um, right, and, and that, that's, you know, it's a good point, and there's, there's arguments on both sides. Um, one of the arguments is 
that you should do it at a, at a more attenuated timeline because the state has proven not very good at updating maps when they've been directed to update maps, whether it's the soil um, quality maps, conservation maps, the wetlands maps, the land use map. <coughs> never, never really did it well. Um, and so give them enough time to do it well. The response to that is they've always had a good amount of time to do the maps in the past and they didn't they never did. The other response is like, hey, they didn't have supercomputers 20 years ago that could do this stuff. They didn't have GIS, they didn't have satellites that were doing this. So maybe it, you give them the time. Um, Maybe, but the response to that is, hey, this is something that people are paying, and do you give somebody a five-year pass because they put in their big, huge patio three weeks after this went into effect? Um, you know, what, there's there's a lot of you know uh, policy things you can debate. I guess anybody, I kind of wanted to <coughs> keep going, so we're, we're going to do sort of a high-level. Are we interested in getting deeper into each of these five things that George has brought to us? So, well, I would just have one quick question. Possibly a terrible idea, but I was thinking when I read that of April first, like the time of the grand list. So that's all I want to say. I'm sure ACGIS is going to have an opinion about that. <laughs> yeah. Should I move on? Yes. Um, on page five, line 10, uh, as Representative Hill noted, this is repealing the sunset, repealing the repeal of the clean water surcharge. So in Act 64, um, you put a clean water surcharge on the property transfer tax. It was supposed to sunset two years later. Instead of sunsetting, what you did is you extended the sunset from, from 2018 uh, to technically 2039. Um, but in 2027, the amount of the surcharge is reduced from 0.2% of the value subject to the property transfer tax to 0.04%. And that's because the first million dollars of the property transfer tax surcharge is used to pay the debt service on the bond that was issued for affordable housing that's administered by the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. So that bond is a 30-year bond, and that's why you have a sunset of the, that million dollars, the 0 0.04, in 2039. In 2027, which is about the time of the, the tier one of the Clean Water Initiative, that that would sunset at that point. Well, what Representative Till is saying, we get rid of the sunset of the 2027 and the 2039. It's just going to be in effect, and the money's going to go into the Clean Water Fund. Well, it, it goes into the Clean Water Fund and the affordable housing debt service until 2039, and then add to that, it's a public clean water fund. So if you're here in 2039, <laughs> um, you, can, you can allocate that money. So. Great, thanks. And that, that is what section two, three, and four are about. And then you come to page six, Line 9, Section 5, this is the Water Quality Occupancy Surcharge. Does everyone know what the Rooms and Meals <coughs> tax is? Yeah, 9%. Right. It's 9%. This is not changing the 9%. This is just an additional dollar per night of occupancy in a room that's subject to the Rooms tax. This is an idea you floated maybe eight or nine years ago. Yep. Um, so uh, that's what you'll see on page six. Um, in addition to the tax on the rent of each occupancy, an 
operator shall collect the water quality occupancy surcharge of one dollar for each net of occupancy. Now, occupancy is defined as pretty much everything that you could think of: <coughs> hotels, motels, um, bed and breakfast, Airbnb. You did the Airbnb, I think it was either last year or the year before. Um, is that, like, just doesn't matter how many people are in the room, just for the room having people in it. Does it apply to other like BBO or the other type of services that allow for short-term rentals versus as opposed to just Airbnb? Right. It's it's yes. It's the the real term is short-term rental. Um, it doesn't apply if after thirty if you rent for a term of thirty days or you rent for two week periods for more than these cats here. This is the one that knows us the best. The two weeks for like over three months a year. So it's it's there's there's some some provisions for when it doesn't apply, but for most most occupancies it's going to apply. Um, so on page six, line uh, 14, the money generated is deposited in the Clean Water Fund, and then it's the enforcement and collection is just the enforcement and collection for the meals and rooms tax under the authority to collect that under 32 BSA 9241. And then on page 7, line 1, section 6, uh, may initiate collection January 1, 2020. Should I move on? Yes. All right, page seven, line six, section seven. People are gonna tell you that this section is unconstitutional. People are gonna say that you can't put a premium or an assessment on the sale of milk without it burdening commerce and discriminating against out-of-state interest. And there have been cases where that has been the opinion of the US Supreme Court but um, the U.S. Supreme Court also said in one of those opinions that states have the ability to tax, provided that they tax in a non-discriminatory way, and provided that the revenue generated from that tax isn't dedicated to an account that benefits Vermont farmers or in-state farmers versus out-of-state farmers. So for an example, the case one of the cases where they held a premium unconstitutional, Massachusetts, which doesn't have a lot of dairy farmers, put a premium on all packaged milk sold into the state. And most of the packaged milk sold into the state was produced in Vermont and New York. And the premium that they put on that packaged milk <coughs> was dedicated to an account that was used to give grants to Massachusetts farmers for their production. The Supreme Court said, yes, Massachusetts, you have the ability to tax, but this tax is discriminatory because 85% of the tax was raised on out-of-state producers. And you then use that 85% used from out-of-state to benefit in-state to give them the ability to have a lower price in commerce and then have a competitive advantage against the out-of-state They're like, that's just <coughs> discriminatory on commerce. That's not what this does. It just puts a fee on milk that milk handlers licensed in this state purchase. So if you're purchasing milk to produce dairy products in the state, which is what effectively a milk handler is, you pay the 0 0.001 cent on each pound that you sell. And that money is then put in the general fund, not a dedicated account for the benefit of farmers, into the general fund 
is appropriated as any general fund money is appropriated. So it does not discriminate against out-of-state commerce. It's not on out-of-state commerce. It's on in-state. Those bill cameras operating in-state. Not dedicated to a fund. It solely benefits Vermont farmers in relation to out-of-state farmers. And by the way, there's already a fee on milk handlers in the state. And Maine has a fee on milk handlers that's based on volume as well. What does the current fee go to? Ours. It's a permit fee that is used for administration of the permit, the program. Represent a dollar. So if we raise a million, I know that Agency of Agriculture has a number of programs that they manage with general fund money, one being their annual projects, you know, their appeal-based practices, another is their, um, their staff, I think another is um, sort of the, maybe um, some other programs. Can they? Sure, but that would not be benefiting farming or farmers in relation to how, that is just use of general fund monies for the traditional general fund uses uh, uh, in the general fund. So th this is this is not something that is solely dedicated to farming or something that gives farmers a benefit in relation to out-of-state farmers. Representative McCullough. I'm thinking this this um, point zero zero one dollars is, is not is not in that commerce. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. But, so is 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 a hauler a milk handler or is it really is it looks like it looks like this is primarily the processors. So a milk handler is a person, firm, unincorporated association or corporation engaged in the business of buying, selling, assembling, packaging, or processing milk or other dairy products for sale within or without the state. It shall not mean a milk producer. A milk producer is the partnership unincorporated person, unincorporated association who owns or controls one or more cows go sheep or water buffalo and sells or offers for sale in part for all of the milk produced by the animals. That's the farmer. Representative Odie. No, that, oh, sorry. Well, in between the bulk tank and Agamark in, in Massachusetts <coughs> is a person who hauls the milk down there. I'm, I'm thinking that person doesn't buy the milk and then resell it to Agamark, but and therefore don't fall into this, but it, it, so. That would be something that they're gonna to have to work out on their own, whether or not they're using a marketing service or not, which is some of the intricacies and delicacies of the milk industry. Oh, typically, uh, farmers uh, own the milk until it's been delivered. So the delivery would be wherever, whether it's out of state or in state. So, What's that? So, 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 they are, they are, in addition to the requirements of section 2721, um, or any other tax that they have to pay, they pay to the Secretary of Agriculture a handling fee of 0 .001 per pound to the mill. Um, and then you'll see that if there's a provision that they shall not assess that fee back to the farmer, uh, like they have done with hauling costs and some other costs, and they will be penalized $5,000 um, for 
for each shepherd up to five thousand dollars. No, it's actually it's just five thousand on each separate instance. The secretary determines one or both of the following occurred. The milk handler deducted the assessing the handling fee uh, from the payment to the milk producer, and then the milk handler otherwise charged or assessed the milk producer for the cost, including by increasing the hauling charge to recruit the milk handler. So I see that it's almost 4.30. I would like to keep going through this with you. Are you able to stay with us? Sure. And um, Laura, if you need to go, Jim can turn off the record for okay. us. That's great. I'm just going to send you an email now. Okay. Okay. Representative Oden. Um, quick thing. I think you might have answered it already, but that, so if a farmer owns a milk flow that's delivered, does that mean if it goes to Cabot? Even it's a cooperative, it's a cooperative a producer, a cooperative, does the cooperative have to pay that uh, fee? There are no cameras. There are no Because they handle it all. <laughs> all right. So you'll see the chair asks, it's, it's um, remitted and collected in the same way as the current fee, and you'll see that on um, page 8 going on to page 9. At the time that they apply for their handler license and on their renewal, when they pay their application fee, they also pay the milk handling fee. Mm -hmm. Should I move on? So page 10, line 5, section 9. This is as Representative Till noted that there is an assessment on asphalt and the assessment is on the manufacturer. So does everybody know what asphalt is so I don't have to read the definition? So the manufacturer is pretty much every version of manufacturer that you can think of. Those who actually manufacture it for sale in the state, those who distribute it for sale um, when it's manufactured by another person those who imported into the United States when the, import, the person that manufactured doesn't have a U.S. presence. So that's pretty much you're actually manufacturing, you're distributing for somebody that manufactured it out of state, or you're <coughs> importing it into the state um, by somebody that doesn't have the U.S. presence. You'll see on page 11, line 1, the manufacturer who sells asphalt in the state to a state agency, municipality, or private entity shall pay an assessment of $1 per ton to the department. Now, one of the things that's, that's going to be difficult about this program is you have to stand it up first because nobody's actually reporting this right now to the department, and the department can't, can't collect and audit something that they don't have records on. So um, you'll see that there's a payment requirement. Each manufacturer submits to the department a monthly report showing the total tonnage of asphalt sold in or sold in the state by the manufacturer in the prior month. So there you go, the department gets its, its data. Then the manufacturer shall pay the assessment on each ton of asphalt sold, sold in or sold into the state each month at the same time the report is issued. The money is then the money is deposited in the clean water fund and used for the purposes of that fund. The records, each manufacturer shall keep a record of the tonnage of asphalt sold in or, or into the state and shall retain those records for at least five years. Um, records of the tonnage of asphalt sold in the state shall be available at all times for inspection by the commissioner. Then there's enforcement. The requirements of this shall be enforced using the enforcement and collection provision set forth in Chapter 103 of Title 32. That's sales and use tax. Thank you. That's that.